Hello, welcome to Not the BBC. So the following is a conversation I had with Matthew Eritz. Matthew is a historian and a geopolitical analyst. He's got a really great body of work. I recommend you check out his website, canadianpatriot.org, and also look up the Rising Tide Foundation. Um, Matthew's written tons of stuff on the Anglo-American Empire, and specifically he recently wrote a series called The New Eugenics, Transhumanism and the Myth of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Um, this gives us some real historical context about the Great Reset, so I wanted to get him on to discuss it. We have a grand sweeping conversation, it's a lot longer than my usual conversations, but I really wanted to, to give a comprehensive take on what's going on, because that's what Matthew is very, very capable of doing. So we sort of start off by looking at what exactly the Great Reset is in Matthew's eyes, looking at the financial aspect of it, we then go all the way back to 18th, 19th century British Empire to some of the issues that the Upper Cross were facing and how that led to the foundations for what we're seeing today being put in place. And then at the modern day, Matthew provides us with a slightly different take on what's going on and dispels some myths about China and Russia. I really, really enjoyed the conversation. I hope you do too. And I reckon we just go ahead and listen to it. Hello, Matthew. Welcome to Not the BBC. Hey, well, thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you on here. Um, you actually were requested in the comments. I did an interview with G. Edward Griffith recently, and you were one of the names requested in the comments. And I kind of I'd come across your work in, I suppose, October, November time. So sort of checked back into what you're writing, and I read your, uh, amongst other things, I read your series, The New Eugenics, Transhumanism, and the Myth of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Kind of glad I glad I did in the sense that I now feel more informed at the, at the same time kind of a bit unsettling as well because it sort of substantiated I guess some of the um, the more sort of uh, you know my kind of my worst fears about or some, the more pessimistic take let's say about about where things are going right sort of substantiated and took some of the um, I guess some of the sort of kind of dystopian elements took them out of caricature land and actually kind of gave me a bit of a f understanding for kind of the roots of them so mm. <laughs> kind of a sweet you know a sweet and sour kind of experience but I think we're you know we're in this mission to to get wiser so um, but yeah I'm very glad to to have you on and to speak to you about all that today oh well I, I'm very much looking forward to this conversation excellent so I guess just to start off um, it'd be great in, in your own words for you just to for you to explain what the World Economic Forum's Great Reset is and what's how, how you see what's going on right now. Okay, yeah, sure. Well, the way I, I the way to understand the Great Reset doctrine that came about last summer uh, as an official sort of name given to a policy that was already there. It, it's it's not like this was the creation of this new policy last summer. It, it was already there. Um, it, you have to understand a little bit about the context of recent history it, it it'll be useful keeping in mind that the the world economic forum what is it well, who is klaus schwab who founded it and runs it like a, passing himself off like a creepy little super villain talking about you know this great future where nobody will own anything but will be happy because the people who he works with are going to own everything um so this was 1971 70 71 you had a few things happening internationally that were all interconnected. And, and a lot of people make the mistake of thinking of these as different things. Um, you had the, the dollar, the US dollar being taken off of the gold reserve standard and floated onto the world markets. You had the creation of the petrodollar that tied the value of money of currencies that everybody had to have US dollars since World War II as part of the, the basis of the economy. The, the value was, was detached from measurable industrial production, which it used to be, that was much more reasonable, and it was floated onto speculative markets that were then increasingly tied to speculation on oil, spot markets, futures markets, things that had no real bearing in production. It was all like based on people wanting to gamble and make money now without any sense of what reality was. So we became more and more detached from reality, and, and that's the economy became a bubble. Now in 1971, you had Lord Jacob Rothschild created what's called the Inter-Alpha Group of Banks as a new conglomerate of major banks, each representing a different power center of Europe uh, that interfaced very closely with the city of London, the, the, Euro, the, uh, the Wall Street zone as well. And this became um, another aspect of the system of capturing nation states. The idea was always you have this problematic existence. If you're an, if you're an 
an imperialist, you know, you're looking at the world thinking, okay, we got this problem of nation states that seem to be organized around the defense of their own interests, which is not compatible with our idea of hegemony, mm. right? Most of human history has been unipolar. There's been one empire, one center of command. Sometimes it, it migrates, but it's generally one center that imposes its will of a small chosen elite, a hereditary class onto the masses. So they're, they've always been thinking, how do we destroy that? Now, they, they, they couldn't do it, though they tried many times to do it by force. And we can talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but what they realized in 1971 is it's more effective to do it by self-inducement. Mm. And so part of this new logic became create a consumer cult society rather than having a producer consumer society. Because to justify your consumption, you had to produce, have, you had to have manufacturing science industry that had to be a justifier for consumption. They said, no, we don't need that anymore. That's the old, that's the old uh, wisdom. The yeah. new wisdom is we can just consume and poor people that we don't look at can do sweatshops producing cheap stuff that we now uh, used to do ourselves at a higher quality. That became the new norm. Mm. And you made a lot of money easily in a short myopic period, but you destroyed the future. Yeah. So that went on now. Um, that, that was what Paul Volcker called the controlled disintegration of the world economy in 1978 at Warwick University in London. So, and Paul Volcker is the guy who, you know, took this to another level under the Trilateral Commission when uh, he became Federal Reserve Chairman by jacking mm -hmm. up interest rates, which were done also in Europe to 20% for three years that destroyed the small and medium enterprises. The vitality of the, the world economy was the small and medium enterprises. They were wiped out farmers were wiped out in Monsanto, the big cartels were, the, were able to gobble up on the cheap all of the bankrupt enterprises. So <clears throat> Sounds this, familiar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they're just repeating the same formula today with, a, with another wealth transfer, a big one. Mm. And, so uh, when he, so it's just interesting to so say when he talks about the controlled disintegration of the economy and it's sort of entailed in that is a small and medium business. So he, he kind of, that suggests that he or that there's some view which views uh, which kind of sees small and medium business being the sort of heart of i guess mom and pop capitalism was that sort of how the economy was understood at the time sort of and yeah. that, that's this notion of the producer economy where you know the average citizen is very is very actively involved in the production of goods and that's quite there's quite a deep penetration amongst the population and so when he means disintegrating that he kind of means sort of flattening that whole paradigm well, what he meant, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a double entendre. Uh, so there's, there's multiple meanings. Now, the official meaning, what he was uh, getting across is we need to get stop the, the increasing inflation crisis of the 70s. Mm -hmm. Inflation was hitting 12.5% by 1980. So we need to uh, jack up interest rates to stop the inflation by constricting the amount of credit available mm -hmm. um, to the system and thus have like a controlled disintegration. That was one level. Yeah. But when you look at the Trilateral Commission program that he was a part of, you read Zbigniew Brzezinski, you read David Rockefeller yeah. III, mm. you read Kissinger, who's all part of this same complex that, that Volcker is a part of, you see that there is a second more nefarious meaning that had more to do with creating a controlled disintegration on, lo on the longer scale, which is mm. what we're now seeing play out with the, the collapsing of the speculative bubble economy. Um, now that nations have been sufficiently self-stripped down to not be able to have economic sovereignty like we used to. And yeah. as you pointed out, the, the composition of the workforce used to be after World War II for the 20 years after, uh, on average of about 35 to 40% manufacturing in the labor force. Uh, services were a negligibly smaller part. It's a useful but still secondary part of the economy as a whole. Mm-hmm. If you just look at the trend over the past 40 years, the manufacturing has slipped down, down, down to le far less than 10% of the labor force now because it's all been outsourced. Yeah. And services, financial services, what's called the fire economy, um, you know, real estate speculation, um, finance, th this is all taken over as a parasite. So now we've got these bubbles that have become the economy. It's $1.2 quadrillion of derivatives that are mm -hmm. like just... Con there's, there's insurance on bets on insurance of debts that won't be paid anyway so it's all like <laughs> it's it's gonna there's so many points of collapse in yeah. this so that, that, yeah so yeah so essentially you know this this modern economy is the 
it's sort of spending being directed into parts which have essentially zero or an almost negative leverage in the sense that they don't create wealth, they don't create any long standard value. Long standing value is just sort of funneling everyone's energy and all their wealth and everything that we've built up historically into things that aren't really um, yeah, the benefit, it's, you know, the people in general. Exactly. Your negative, negative value ideas is exactly what happened is they, they, they created new conditions to do what an economy should never do. Like the point of capitalism is to create systems that will cr- increase capital. It will create, increase and improve upon capital. <laughs> there has to be something being created. Yeah. Um, but if you can create new rules as they did after the 1970s, uh, that channel everybody's industrial, like the energy of the system, if you channel workers into areas of employment that are actually destructive to the system as a whole, but you monetize it, you make it monetarily incentivized, then you can, ex- you can cause the system by virtue of how you've constructed the values uh, to, to increasingly self-implode. And that's what they did for the speculative markets, right? You could tr- you could spend $200,000 training at Harvard to get a, an economics degree. You go out and you just do what you've been trained to do and you're actually destroying the system, but you're making money. Now that's today what Klaus Schwab, when he's coming out on his conferences saying the ethic of, you know, market liberalization and, uh, you know, libertarian economics, which was Friedman. I mean, this was what 1970s, 80s was characterized by, you know, Thatcherism, Reaganomics, it was all like Milton Friedman deregulation. He, Klaus Schwab is saying that has proven itself to be unsustainable and we need a new paradigm. And, you know, part of that is kind of true. That's why these yeah. evil things work. But it was also uh, fantastic for them as well because it enabled, the, you know, the financial bubbles and, and the rest of it and for them to kind of get their claws everywhere. Exactly. And now they're saying, well, we are going to need a new system. We're going to reset this system using the opportunity of COVID-19, the pandemic, which is, has very questionable origins um, based on the fact that the World Economic Forum was hosting things like the Event 201 already before mm. the pandemic officially became an excuse to shut down the economies. But basically, they're saying, okay, now we're going to bring on a new uh, system that'll deal with COVID as w- and also, at the same time, kill two birds with one stone will also accelerate a decarbonization of the world economy to stop the crisis of global warming, which, again, they say is caused by human industrial activity, which you just need to shut down to save the earth. So we'll do to these two things. But yeah. the problem is, to do these two things, we can't have nation states governing their own affairs anymore. We need to have supranational bodies above nation states to enforce the contraction of a uh, production of co2 under the paris climate accords and this is where you have a fight because you got a certain grouping of nations in the world who are saying uh they'd rather not be sacrificed on the altar of gaia to this globalist unipolar elite and this is where you have a multipolar uh organization of of nation states Mm -hmm. on the one side of the world that are being very demonized, whether it's Russia is hacking the Western democracies or China's causing the overthrow of Western liberal values by unleashing COVID, whatever it is. Like there's so many narratives being thrown out. But the fact is both of these countries, Russia, China, uh, increasingly Iran is a part of that, are working to say, we need nation states, we need development, we need banking that's run by nation states, not private financiers. Um, And the other side, you have Klaus Schwab's network, Bill Gates and that whole coterie in the West saying, no, no nation states, depopulation, yada, yada. So there's a battle over who's going to control the narrative and Great Reset yeah. is just sort of the marketing gimmick that's been given to the, the fight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, the, so in terms of this, you know, the financial bubble, the, the, the kind of the system that's been in place since the unpegging um, from the gold standard, mm. this is, um, has it kind of run it, you kind of run away with itself and they've struggled to control it or, you're kind of, it seems that you're suggesting that they kind of always expected it to, um, like they, they, they're very happy for it to come to an end now. It's not, are, are they how, kind of in control of what's happened on the financial side? Obviously, and we'll get to some of this, you know, they, this kind of fits into a general vision they've had for the world for a while. But in terms of where they are with, with the financial system, what is there some degree of them sort of, it sort of kind of being a Frankenstein that sort of run away from them and then now, or are they kind of, yeah, sort of exactly. saying, okay, now it's time. It's time to wind it down. Like, are they how sort of in control are they about how okay. to going? Uh, there's an element of truthfulness in the Frankenstein monster, but maybe not how you think or how your 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 viewers might think. Um, bubbles pop by their nature. 
Um, it's, it's true in the laws of physics. You can only grow a bubble so long. Chew hubba bubba bubble gum, right? That there's only, <laughs> there's a surface tension. There's certain laws in nature that will only allow it to grow before it pops in your face. Um, the same thing has been true since the days of the tulip bubble of uh, the Dutch speculative tulip bubble, right? Where people were like trading castles for tulips and not even tulips. It was like contracts, pieces of paper uh, representing promised tulips, but not even that. Um, that, that by, by its nature, blue and many people knew that they weren't stupid and they were able to buy up pennies on the dollar and, and increase the Dutch oligarchy's wealth by a big wealth transfer back then in the, in the 17th century. Mm. Uh, or 18, early 18th century. Um, <clears throat> same thing happened with the South Sea bubble, the John Law bubble um, of 1720 that blew up. Uh, it's same thing for all, all bubbles. Um, a, a good point of indicator or of looking as an exemplar of, of how this works in the modern times would be the Great Depression of 1929. Mm-hmm. The great, there was a great reset conference that was subverted. People don't know this, or many people I've met don't know this, very few do, that in, that the Bank of England, the League of Nations, and the Bank of International Settlements had organized a major London conference in 1932 that went on for about six months, and it involved 66 nations of the world, mm-hmm. all Commonwealth, obviously, but also they needed the United States to be a part of it. The purpose of this conference was to bring back global stability to the system because things had been pretty much hell since the U.S. bubble blew out in 1929. That was all provably controlled and planned. Um, there's been wonderful research that's been done over the years, but basically the 1920s, especially since the murder of, and I say murder for a reason, but the murder of Warren Harding, the president of the United States, who was uh, poisoned, uh, <laughs> food poisoning of oysters in 1923. Um, ever since that, ever since his death, especially, you had the, de- the deregulation massively of the US economy no more protectionism, complete market speculation, and there was controlled bubbles grown in real estate. Mm. Sound familiar? And these things grew. It was the roaring 20s. Easy money was flowing. And, uh, and it was being, the, the people in charge of this were JP Morgan, the Morgan Banking Interests, and Andrew Mellon, who was the Treasury Secretary for like 12 years. Mm. Um, now, when 1929 Black Tuesday arose, what happened was the all of these financiers at, in a coordinated fashion called in their broker call loan. So all of the stock market brokers were taking big loans out for their, 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 their purposes. A lot of people's savings were tied into uh, their speculative activities. A lot of returns were happening, but all of, they couldn't pay back the loans because they were, they were taking out more loans to, to gamble than they could pay back. So when all of the broker call loans were called in at the, the same day in the same moment, there was a massive wave of defaults and that triggered a chain reaction, obvious, predictable collapse of the whole financial system. Yeah. And it, it endured for four years. But there were a bunch of people who sold, um, who basically sold their stocks before the blowout. And they were all people on JP Morgan's preferred clients list that yeah. came, that was revealed to exist in 1933 under the PCOR Commission hearings mm. under Roosevelt. Yeah. So, all of this was contrived and what they were able to do after the blowout, after they've sold, they made a lot of money. They'd use that money then to buy up pennies on the dollar, all of the businesses that had gone bankrupt. Yeah. Um, but they didn't use those. They didn't retool the businesses to be productive again. They kept those businesses shut down for, for many, like that's why U.S. Steel disappeared by 50% during the four years of the Great Depression. And peop- it was like a shock therapy to destroy, to traumatize people on the mass psyche to accept things that were undemocratic as economic miracle solutions like fascism that would, they would only then be able to accept once they were starved enough. Mm. So that's what the, the great, uh, the great reset conference, I call it that, but it was the, the London conference was designed to say, okay, we need a new world financial system run by central banks. And, um, and Franklin Roosevelt thankfully was able to declare war and he pulled the United States out of all negotiations and that sabotaged the conference. It, it, dis, it basically dissolved into chaos. The King had to say, it's, it's useless. We give up on this for that moment. Mm. And at the same time, Roosevelt was also waging war on wall street by breaking up the banks inside of the U S itself, forcing these bankers to go to trial. Hundreds of bankers went to prison for uh, illegal speculation and uh, many other things were done to revive the economy by channeling credit, government public credit through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation into big infrastructure projects 
which are like today known as the Tennessee Valley Authority, mass electrification, mass education projects for farmers, mm. uh, Hoover Dam projects. I mean, thousands of projects were done to start building up, reviving the, the healthy tissue of the system that had formerly been taken over by this cancerous speculation. So you had to like yeah. carve the speculation, revive the healthy tissue like a doctor. Sort of like what we could do today. Mm. Um, yeah. This is sort of, my, is, is, quite, is that a sort of form of, I guess, economic nationalism? Um, yeah. economic populism how is that distinct from the i've seen you write about this can you quickly talk about how that's distinct from the keynesian model because keynes was obviously very much in a league with, you know he's part fabian and whatnot so people yeah. people often get confused when they're thinking about you know investing in infrastructure and this no, that's very much tied with the notion of keynes and so obviously a lot of people kind of are not really willing to listen to those ideas no, I wrote actually a, a trilogy of articles a little while ago on how a, a generation of Americans were brainwashed on the Keynes versus Hayek uh, debate, mm. uh, which was around 1932-33 when Roosevelt was coming in. Now, there was a false polarization created by the London School of Economics, which is where both of them were based. Um, Keynes himself, as you pointed out, um, was anti-nationalist. He believed in... Uh, world government. He believed in eugenics. He was a member of the eugenics society. He was its treasurer. He believed in uh, Malthusianism. He was part of the Malthusian League, uh, meaning he, belie he believed that governments should only function to the degree that they enforce depopulation uh, for an elite on the behalf of the elite's interest. So this guy was not the humanist <laughs> that we're told he was. Uh, now, von Hayek was also a professor at the London School of Economics and a major debate, a false the polarizing debate was contrived between these two imperialists. And, and yes, Hayek was actually an imperialist. Uh, he believed in essentially, he paid lip service to personal liberty, but, but he also, and I, and I cite him directly in my paper, uh, calls for a globalist policing authorities to enforce uh, authority onto nation states who disobey certain uh, rules. Ant yeah, it's, it kind of, it's, it's sort of anathema to any view of any genuine sort of collectivism, a, a Hayek view, right? Yeah. It's all about the, it's all about sort of just rampant individual and uh, rampant individualism, rampant global markets, everything unchecked, forget caring about nation states, forget any sort of yeah. notion of belonging. Non, you know, but then nothing. he needs to have this idea of a Leviathan that still maintains some sense of rule, rule uh, conformity, which is interesting. You can't, you couldn't break out of that. Yeah. So anyway, Keynes himself, uh, believed Roosevelt was an economic idiot. He, uh, he couldn't, like, he hated Roosevelt. And we're told today that Roosevelt was a Keynesian. Roosevelt himself writes that Keynes was incompetent on, he was a mathematician, not an economist. Um, and sure enough, he was obsessed with balancing equations. He was not an actual real economist. Mm. Um, now, Keynes made the argument that we need, when you have an economic crisis, formulaically, you need government spending to just stimulate the economy. Now, what he does is he is, trying to subvert or those who are controlling him. I don't think he's his own man necessarily, though he is high, high up there. Um, they're trying to subvert the, the practice of American system economics that was being represented most clearly in Europe by a Frederick, Frederick List. Listian economics was what uh, Bismarck was doing. It was what was being practiced in Russia under uh, Tsar Alexander II, the, 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 the third, Nicholas which was dirigism. It was the idea of having protectionism directed credit towards science, technology, infrastructure spending that was, but it was directed around an idea of morality and intention. Mm. It was, it was, it was not chaotic and, but it wasn't Marxist either. It wasn't, it wasn't communist. It was, it was different because it was, a, it was cherishing personal enterprise, free enterprise as well. Uh, so it was, it's not one, it's not communism, it's not capitalism in the laissez-faire sense. It was something else mm. that shaped the 19th century and was still shaping the 20th century as well at that period. And Roosevelt was directly situated in that list uh, American system uh, tradition. He was part of a big network in America around that time uh, who were all a part of that. So that's what Keynes, Keynes's formula was to say, you know, government, government should spend, but his logic for where value comes from was all messed up. He said, by, by spending money, you will give a check to people to, to do work. They will use that check to buy things. The act of buying things as consumers is going to stimulate production by creating a demand. That demand is going to thus mm -hmm. stimulate industry. The industry's needs to have electricity is going to stimulate infrastructure spending and thus infrastructure will somehow grow. That a, doesn't yeah. happen. 
he so he wasn't, he, out. Yeah, so he wasn't sort of deeply grounded in any notions of sort of real value and where sort of where wealth comes from and, and the rest of it. He kind of just thought in some surface way that spending will magically would generate stuff. He didn't have a philosophy, I suppose, on you wealth could, creation. Is that a way to explain no, it? Yeah. He, he, in his system, he could not say why it is incompetent to pay one guy to, to dig a hole and pay another guy to fill the hole back up again. In his yeah. system, it's totally consistent. Or like windmills versus investment in a hydro dam or nuclear power plant, it's the same thing. Because in both cases, they're employing people who will be spending their paychecks to buy, to buy things. And it's a bottom-up uh, formula. It doesn't work that way. Mm. Whereas in the Roosevelt system, it's all about national powers of productivity that are increasing. Mm. You can't, things that, that decrease your overall ability as a nation to produce might create jobs, but they're not legitimate. Mm. They're anti-value, <laughs> negative value, as we were talking about. So that's, that's the, the sleight of hand. Of yeah, things. yeah, I see. And that, I guess that kind of ties in conveniently with the general. I mean, that's kind of analogous to the, the sort of financier. Um, and so, yeah, the financier model, um, which isn't grounded in any sort of national productivity or anything like that. Yes. And yeah, this kind of gets... And so FDR is the person that stands against that. And I suppose... so this whole financing system, it's a way essentially of certain financial powers essentially increasing their reach. They use, um, they stimulate the economy in a way to sort of do, like you said, sleight of hand, right? So people get confused into thinking, oh, actually things are going well. It alleviates pressure. It sort of distracts people. It encourages sort of, I suppose, um, degenerate spending or whatever. It sort of forget, it makes people forget about what, what matters. Mm-hmm. makes people forget about actually kind of giving them stability so that when they want to pull the rugs, it just creates this dependency so that people are kind of distracted from actually doing anything, building any solid foundations underneath themselves. So it just, I guess it works perfectly for them. They increase their reach at the same time as kind of making the opposition ever more feeble because ever more incapable of, of standing up for themselves when the credit runs out, I suppose, right? So that's kind of the, the doctrine of their system. It's a, it's a sort of imperialist approach, right? You said it well. That's a good summary, yeah. Um, and and so, and this goes all the way back. So can we now sort of zoom back to the... Um, so I like the notion of... Um, you can talk about Thomas Huxley now. So I like the notion of Thomas Huxley uh, being hired as a management consultant for, for, the, for the empire. Uh, <laughs> so can we sort of zoom back? So I think we have some idea of kind of the Great Reset, and I will tie in some of the ugly um, transhumanist stuff later. So we have an idea of the sort of financial approach that kind of forces how they kind of, um, con- you know, contrast with s- some opposing models that we've seen, we're seeing today and we've seen in the past. Um, and this all, so this imperative to, um, th- this model, it, does it, it comes from, from the empire kind of realising that actually, People do want belonging. Um, nation, you know, national sovereignty is actually a bit of a testy little little bugger. Um, and yeah, how how do we kind of continue our reach? Sort of, can you sort of get you know provide that sort of frame yeah, yeah. for us? For sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I guess the best way to approach that is that. Okay, let's 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 keep it on Keynes, then I'll leap to Huxley. Uh, okay. So the way empires tend to in reality operate is not through the cartoonish thing we're often taught, like, you know, the, you know, military expansionism, suppression of the weak and uh, exploitation of the resources. Like that's a component of it, but that's not the essence of empire. There's something, there's deeper things that we're, we're, we're not being, uh, we're not privy to when we think of it in that, in those simplistic terms, one of the guiding uh, mechanisms or, or universal constants of, of oligarchy throughout time is this commitment to stability, mm-hmm. that the system must be kept controllable, predictable, and static. Um, it manifests with different language in time, you know, but whether you're looking at the Babylonian priesthood and the system of controls that it, it desired or, or the Roman Empire, which continuously demanded that stability and stasis within the capital while it would dominate and spread around the world to extract more resources from the periphery to feed into the, uh, the diminishing rates of returns of the capital through festivals to keep people stupefied, right, and, and entertained. Um, it's the same sort of thing. It, and it just migrates and changes its character or its form a bit. Uh, Keynes was obviously a mathematician, 
Roosevelt was right about that criticism and he was committed absolutely to stability as the ultimate good. Uh, the formula always has to balance and every system can be described in a closed way at any given moment because there's a certain amount of people, there's a certain amount of space, there's a certain amount of resources that are needed at any given time. So you can have you know, a relatively mathematical description of the rates of of production, consumption, transportation, transformation of goods through production, productivity. You can, you can do that at any given moment um, in time as a snapshot. Now, unlike the animal species, which we find, you know, obviously anywhere in nature, you could take a rabbit population and take a snapshot in time of those characteristics of the rabbit population, which lives in a certain zone, which requires input, output, you know, mm. energy to do its thing. It, it's population density and the overall quantity of rabbits that can be sustained are really tied to the function of environment, the constraints of the environment. If there's more or less abundance, if there's less abundance due to famine or whatever, the mommies will start cannibalizing the babies. And that's just the population will self-regulate um, and genetic, genetic dispositions. You know, the, the, the ones that are born with like, you know, a, 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 a gimp leg are going to mm. die out. Yeah. You know? um, so that's, that's there. Human beings have those aspects to us, but we have something additional because our populations will tend to be variable based upon our creation of new discoveries mm. or our forgetfulness. Our, our, like in dark ages or under empires, you tend to see libraries of Alexandria burned down. You see a, a sabotage of creative thought consciously to keep the system sta stationary. Yeah. And by forgetting how we used to do things, you get the Easter Island problem, right? They forgot how to use, how to create astro navigating yeah. big ships and they it's, it's interesting you know I, I, have you heard of someone called Sir, um ian mcgilchrist no he wrote a book called the divided brain and he talks about sort of left brain models of the world and right brain models of the world and he talks about how sort of societies tend eventually tend towards being super left brain like they at the end of the roman empire it was super left brain and by this point everything's become you know it's sort of very measurable very narrow um a very means to an end and pe you know people kind of forget um you kind of forget why you're doing things all innovation stops it becomes more savage and stuff like that and so yeah. the kind of um the way you're you're kind of framing it kind of helps make sense of that sort of world in that yeah. as empires go powers could get controlled you know powers centralized power you know centralized control over things and things become more of a formula things become more mathematical yeah. um yeah, no, I, just, I was wondering if you heard of him because it, it kind of actually dovetails pretty nicely with um, some of his thinking. No, I'd like to read him though. I, it's a, yeah, it's, it's synergistic with what I'm saying. And, and I mean, I think the only way that you can break that problem of, of it's like every, every, you see that expressed on the small scale too, right? When a new discovery is made, there's at the, at the start, the cause of the discovery is creative passion. It's, it's the disobedience to uh, standard models, Mm. Um, which are all think everybody's thinking the wrong way. That's why the discovery hasn't been made yet, right? And so somebody is defiant because they're they're more committed to truth than they are to being popular or being keeping their job or something, right? So there's a lot of of creative beauty and energy. But then what happens is what that new discovery can be symbolically described by uh, you know some mathematical symbolism of some sort that is useful. Mm. It's useful because there's certain constants to every discovery. But it's not like that's all there is. It's like that's a new platform to build new discoveries off of, or it should be. Mm. But what will often happen will be people start worshiping the formula and they start thinking that that's the discovery. You know, like kids in, yeah. I, I used to get pissed off in mathematics class, which I failed all my mathematics class in high school because I wanted to know why are these formulas true? Mm. Why is the Pythagorean theorem true? And all I would get were these circular, unsatisfying answers is that they were true because they're true. And it's like, no, they're true because there's something about reality that was discoverable that could then be expressed that way. And if, if teachers taught it that way, guaranteed kids would become mathematically proficient in a, in a much more fruitful way than they are today. Yeah. They wouldn't be worshiping symbols. So this incrustation of formula then becomes something which brings about insecurity and people start defending the, the, the encrusted crystallized uh, yeah. worshiping system of the formula at the expense of people who the are now creative thinkers. Yeah, the policy becomes um, the principle. 
Unfor- unfortunately, yeah. unfortunately, I, I heard that from Tony Blair, but it, it, I find it quite a useful phrase. Um, but I suppose, yeah. So uh, you know, once you kind of, it's, you know, if you think about the way startups grow, they find a way of they find a way to generate value, and then once they, yeah. and that's all sort of innovative. And once they do that, it's all about systematization and anything that kind of. And so I suppose as empires grow, they kind of figure out what works, and essentially all they care about is every all you know all the mass of the people just essentially fitting into that, and and any thought that's too divergent, obviously just becomes a threat to the the continued growth and, and existence of the system, I guess. Well, there's two aspects to this, because on the one hand, um, empires themselves, if you actually look at the causes of great discoveries, empires usually, I, I can't find any examples where their system caused a discovery. What they will often do is uh, steal discoveries made by others. You know, in the case of Rome, we had uh, a lot of the, 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 the colonies in Ionia that were being that had cultures, fruitful cultures uh, that produced creative discoveries that were then taken over and the, uh, the disco- like the, the use of, of machinery, aut- automatons, uh, of, of, of even building sewage systems was then adopted and applied in the Roman capitals, mm. but it wasn't something indigenously created from them. They just stole it. And a lot of those technologies were used <laughs> for the sake of entertaining the population and pacifying them in the form of like elevators in the Colosseum uh, or, you know, little machines that wouldn't be, they, they would be used. They had little coin operated machines for entertainment purposes in Rome that they recently discovered, mm-hmm. but th- th- they could have used that same tech to build mills to, to help produce things that would be beneficial to people, but they didn't have the, the morality to mm-hmm. think to do that or they didn't want to. They'd rather use them to keep people pacif- pacified and entertained. Mm. So on the one hand, you have that. On the other hand, the empire, um, empires themselves, if they're empires, they'll, they'll tend to latch onto a nation. Like, let's say Britain, right? I wrote uh, a few things recently going through how Britain, you know, back in the time of Erasmus or uh, later on of Shakespeare or a little bit later on, uh, or Thomas More around the time of Erasmus. Um, Britain was not an empire. They were not an empire. It was a nation that was, that had a fight in it. Henry the seventh of Tudor, you know, he was, he was a good man. He really mm-hmm. wanted to reform the, the system and force the treasuries to, to be spent not on wars, but rather on investments into canals mm-hmm. and improving the lives of the people. So people like Thomas More, Erasmus were trying to revive and defend that characteristic of, of Britain. And it took a while for the the oligarchs who had that who had, in those days were still centered in Venice. They had yeah. only begun to migrate out of Venice, which had, which was sort of the armpit of uh, Italy. It was the lagoons, right, where the the ruling families of Rome they moved and migrated to after Rome collapsed with the the invasion of the the Visigoths. So these families they 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 moved like a little a little parasite. Yeah, they set up shop. They reconstitute themselves in Venice. And is this is and, Venice interesting at this point because the sort of merchant yeah. world, the sort of seafaring enterprising uh, enterprise, yeah. is all kind of kicking off. So that's um, where the where the money is, I suppose, and where the that's what the money is. They, they had global controls of bullion, of gold bullion, silver, mm. uh, global trade routes on the maritime seas, global onland routes with the Mongols. Even like they were providing intel to the Mongols and had the the sole rights to do trade on Mongolian controlled territory, which also makes you wonder how the hell did the Mongolians who were not known for their cultural uh, advancement, how did they get such incredible intelligence on the kingdoms of the West that they, they increasingly took over flawlessly. And the Venetians were known for having the the most intricate intelligence apparatus in the world that could profile the weaknesses of every, uh, every court and every King that was out there and provide early intelligence for those assets they wanted to use as battering rams. They did it with the Turks as well when they wanted the, the, the Turks in 1450 to destroy Constantinople. The, the Venetians had a special Turkish house and they worked very closely to deploy the Turks to destroy their big sister in Constant, Constantinople so that they could become the sole world empire instead of being second string to Byzantium. Mm. Um, so, that was, I mean, they wiped it out they, they, and they, become the, they became the global dominant force at that time that Erasmus and Thomas More were alive. So at, at that moment, there was a migration shift where they realized that it wasn't a very secure zone in Italy that they were in. They needed new, a new base of operations. And what you saw from the, the migration was a shifting of the, the zone of influence to first the Netherlands, Hmm. 
the creation of the Dutch East India Company, the creation of the Bank of, of Amsterdam, modeled on the, 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 a major central bank in Venice as the world's first sort of, or second central bank, private central bank. And then, in, and then later on, they, they had to smother out any remnants of the Shakespearean, Erasmian cultural movements that were very politically influential in Europe, uh, in, in Britain. Uh, by taking over Britain, installing their their and this Dutch is when we get the the glorious revolution, yeah, and we very excitingly get constitutional democracy, yeah, uh, you know, conveniently just before a central bank, um, you know, Bank of England's form, right? So it kind of it. kind of kind of helps you explain how things work a little bit when you see how neatly all these events cluster, doesn't it? Sometimes? Yeah, and 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 the thing that's so important in this story is that there was resistance powerful resistance under Queen Anne, which is so, mostly written out of history books. Um, but for a good 15, 20 years, even you had people like uh, Jonathan Swift, who became a leading advisor to uh, Robert Harley, the prime minister of Queen Anne. Um, Gottfried Leibniz, a, a great scientist, was playing a major uh, strategizing role in this whole process to beat back the Bank of England in this, this takeover. And they had created things like the, uh, the, the National British Land Bank in, in a year after the Bank of England was created. They created their own national land bank to destroy, to replace the private central bank of the city of London. And this was supposed to be, and it's wired into the constitution, which by the way, was written by uh, the great um, author Daniel Defoe, who wrote uh, Robinson Crusoe. He was actually, he wrote the constitution for oh, Robert wow. Harley. That is beautiful. You could get this online. And it goes through the purpose of value is to fund manufacturing, elevate the minds of the people, like all, really good. good. That's called cameralism at the time. It was done in France. Anyway, that's another story. Um, so there was a, a fight against this. And it was only with the death of Queen Anne in, I think it was 1714, that the Venetian faction that was then being led by the, the guy who ran the British military, he's the guy who facilitated the takeover of, of Britain um, in 1688 with a small coterie of, of satanic bastards. Uh, his name was Marlborough, uh, the Duke of Marlborough, the John Churchill, the great, 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 great grandfather of uh, Winston. Winston. Yeah. He was also, his namesake, uh, Marlborough Churchill, was an American uh, in the 20th century who set up the Black Chamber on behalf of MI6 in 1919, uh, to, which is the predecessor of the NSA today. And this, he was also the guy who created the... Uh, when the Black Chamber was dissolved in 1929, 1930, uh, he created the Macy Foundation, which was the funder of the cybernetics conferences, which we can talk about later on, mm. that was a major funder of eugenics research, as well as cybernetics and systems, intel uh, systems uh, and, uh, analysis it, from 1943 to 1953 with MKUltra. Mm. So there's an interesting... So, yeah, uh, interesting intermingling. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, Bertrand Russell as well, you know, like Bertrand Russell, who managed a lot of this grand strategy um, at the end of the 19th century and throughout the, the 20th century until he died in, in 1972. He was also, you know, an, a multi eighth generation British, British oligarch. Um, but the problem with the aristocracy, see, here's what happens. When Queen Anne dies and, the, and Robert Harley is put in the Tower of London, uh, Britain is increasingly induced into becoming now officially an empire. Mm. It's really now on a new course. Uh, it expands and becomes more virulent in its, in its treatment of its colonies. Um, it, it expands, uh, it, it takes control of the seas increasingly, goes to war with France, wipes out France's control of, or, or opposition to, uh, to some of that. Now, France as well is not good either. Like they're controlled by a bunch of Jesuits and Freemasons as well, you know, it's, who, are, who are like killing Louis the, the 15th and his kids um, by poisoning. Um, but you, you have now this new, this new process mm. of global domination, unipolarism to create a one world, new, a new Roman empire. Mm. Um, that's what they're governed by as a, as a mythology of the Roman empire that they're now <sighs> yeah. heirs to. And um, coming out of that, that suppression is a freedom movement that took many decades of, of culmination and, and subtle organizing over the 1700s uh, to prepare for, which expressed itself with the 1776 rebellion of the colonies. Um, and, and for the first time in world history, 
a, a, a nation was was constituted, founded upon not the the rights of the elite or hereditary powers, but the inalienable rights of all individuals as being sovereign. Everybody was sovereign because mm-hmm. we're made in the image of a creator, and that's why we had inalienable rights. I'm Canadian. We don't we don't have that here, but I'm saying the broader we. Um, yeah. It wasn't just one sovereign that granted or could take away rights. That's not where rights came from. That was illegitimate. It was an offense to natural law to organize laws that way. Mm. So there's more philosophical depth than people realize to the Americans. So there's uh, that, that's actually something that we can look back on positively. I'm sure it was more complex than the sort of, you know, utopian, you know, yeah. sort of fairy story about America. But it's tempting, mm-hmm. you know, you get super black pilled when you sort of see how many of the things we looked at, you know, we looked to for hope. Um, we're sort of all kind of, um, I guess, m- many of these revolutions, they're sort of revolts from above and, and whatnot. But it seems that there was actually something very special about what happened um, you know, around that time. You never want to paint a black and white brush generally onto most of history because you miss mm. the nuance. And the nuance is where the richness, the ironies come where out. where the part is, yeah. Yeah, and, and there was indeed um, evil bastards who loved slavery as a way to organize society. And I would say they're, they're, they were part you know, that, that's something that, that tainted America's history mm. is the slave power idea that even though it says all men are created equal, we're actually going to organize ourselves defined of that anyway and, and have, a, you know, little local slave, slave lords mm. uh, controlling cotton plantations. Um, and then on the other hand, you actually did have real, real revolutionary Prometheans who were willing to risk their lives and die to defend an ideal of conscience um, that they... I mean, again, they, they were willing to put their necks out there. So mm. it shows you that there's more to it. Yeah. Um, and so what, what happens, this gets us now to Thomas Huxley, because by mm. the time Thomas Huxley is being brought in, I mean, the, the empire is getting decadent and lazy. Uh, they have become, and Huxley talks about this, his student H.G. Wells, who's a Fabian Society leader, talks about this as well in his autobiography that there's a crisis in the empire because they have, they had gotten so used to their formula functioning and and instead of thinking creatively Mm -hmm. that a few generations now had passed and the, the impulse for Liberty was becoming hard to suppress. Mm -hmm. They had done a fairly good job by, by derailing the French revolution, which was, it was supposed to go very differently than, Uh than what we saw but a lot of the greatest leaders of the French revolution who were working with Benjamin Franklin, who wanted to replicate uh, the, you know, the success of 1776, they were all quickly uh, decapitated <laughs> as, as the, the, the Jacobin mob, it turned into a color revolution. Mm. Um, and I've actually written a, a, a document on that. So that's, um, so this is all real slap in the face to, to the empire. They're kind of it's sort of, they're getting, it's crazy to think that we're you know, 300 years later, we're still in, in this decline phase. We kind of think like, you know, it's interesting to zoom back and kind of realize that they were, you know, this kind of rot had already set in so far before. But they were getting lazy. They were get, and that's the thing. So there, there were still uh, bursts of freedom happening all over the world in Asia, especially after the civil war uh, in the 18... 18- we saw it coming out of the 1850s, 1860s. Russia was beginning to get a better understanding of this Venetian evil, how, how these operatives were getting nations to destroy themselves mm. through certain uh, techniques. Um, free trade being just one of many to open up your borders and just let the you know, East India Company rule um, <clears throat> or dump goods, dump cheap goods onto your nation to, to break uh, local manufacturing. And increasingly, it was becoming evident, like the Civil War the union was preserved because Russia, Alexander II, deployed the Russian Navy to the United States, as I'm, I'm sure you know, right? Mm. To, uh, as a direct message to the British and colonial uh, French powers to say, if you go in openly now supporting the Confederate uh, slave power, it will be war on Russia, mm. and we're not going to let that happen. So that kept them at bay, and there were other, other things too. But then Inc- Russia- incidentally, when I'm nodding my head, it's not because I'm super knowledgeable. It's actually because I've been preparing for this interview, reading some, <laughs> reading some of your work. That's where a lot of these, these head nods are coming from. Um, but yeah, continue. <laughs> cool. um, yeah, it's a mind blower for a lot of people. I discovered that only recently and I was, I was like, wow, that changes everything. Yeah. Uh, but then what you saw with, I mean, Russia was immediately adopting the American system of Lincoln of protect- protective tariffs directed credit with the help of American engineers and American statesmen who are going abroad and helping these nations 
uh, apply what Lincoln did with the greenbacks, but also mm. developing rail development like the Trans Siberian built with Philadelphia. It's uh, interesting. That- it's interesting you see a lot of these same you know history can look quite chaotic but you see a lot of these same patterns and it's actually in some ways it's not as as complicated as we we sometimes think it's a lot of, no it's, it's there it's is a real really complex artificially to 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 shut our minds off or to confuse us yeah but there are there are organizing principles that are intelligible and and it's mm. yeah if you zero in on those it's much more much more easy to get your mind around it um but all that to say, this was spreading all over. The Meiji Restoration was adopting U.S. locomotives, American practices of banking, protectionism, South America, Argentina. And everybody was sort of like wising up very fast to the evil of how the British and the, these different Freemasonic like intelligence networks were, were operating in every country. So at that point, this is where Thomas Huxley is brought in as not from a, a rich family, but they're in a, a real crisis of creative thought. They don't know, they can't adapt the system, which is too crystallized mm-hmm. to the spread of na- nationalism around the world. So Huxley is seen, he's recognized as a talent early on as a misanthropic um, surgeon working in the ghettos on syphilis patients. He's developing like a deep seated hatred of man. Um, but he's again, talent searched. He's quickly recruited. He's given patronage. He finds himself in a quick period by his late twenties. He's now like a leader of the Royal Society. He's being brought into the inner Cambridge, you know, uh, think tanks of the day, and he's assigned to do a job. And that job is the essentially it, it expresses itself in the creation of a new school of explanatory science called uh, Darwinism, which is basically a repackaging of Malthusianism. Under, are, they, are they already are they already interested in Malthus by this point? The this sort of empire's ruling class is Malthus. that are they already kind of steeped in that? Malthus, be, before this period, before yeah, from the from Malthus's 1799 essay on the principle of population up until 1850, that was like the state scientific religion was Malthusianism. Mm. That's why they justified the repeal of the Corn Laws in Ireland, uh, which was a controlled famine, a controlled population check. Uh, on the Irish who would produce like rabbits, you know, mm. um, they were, they were applying it to the controlled famines in, in India too, as, as a course of, of unfortunate necessity under the dismal science. It's a convenient, of, it's, I suppose it's a convenient philosophy for given their, their imperatives, right? Yeah. They can sort of create a moral framework for, for their, their self-interest, right? Yeah. They they were self-consciously Malthusian and it was, yeah, it was done as a veneer to say, okay, free trade demands that we have certain free trade agreements to export a certain amount of goods per year. And you have to honor that by not having protective tariffs, even if you have a famine. So even if you're producing enough food to to stop the famine, you can't because we have these free trade agreements Mm. to extract that food from Ireland or from India. And so be it if people die in the millions, so be it. Um, And that was enforced by, by military, you know, by the British East India company mercenaries had their, you know, guns on the farmers saying like, give it up. Um, So yeah, this is, it's, it's all a veneer and it's all part of a scientific priesthood, which Mm. has to do things that people are not allowed to know about because they would rebel. So Mm. they use convenient theories and Darwin became a repackaging like Darwin himself admits in his autobiography that he got his theory explaining natural selection and the, the evolutionary direct uh, changes in fossils by reading Thomas Malthus's essay on on the principle of population where he says, and it was by then appreciating the, uh, the race for of the strongest against the fittest for uh, resources in an, in a world of diminishing returns that, that I at, at last got a theory by which to work. And he says mm. that in, and when he's on the Beagle. And, you know, so he's coming up now with... Now, I'm not saying that the creationists and, and the literal interpretationists of the Bible are right. I'm not saying that. I'm yeah. saying that there were a whole fruitful school of potent biologists and scientists around Alexander von Humboldt that included big networks in America like Benjamin Silliman, James Dwight Dana, Carl uh, Ernst von Bayer, mm. um, Lamarck. Um, Cuvier. There, there are so many fruitful schools that were looking at fossils and looking at the directed creative evolution in life that they were developing more fruitful modes of ex- explanation of how this is happening and what must be the nature of, of creation such that these directed non-chaotic flows of creative changes in nature happen such mm. that it then produced human beings. 
mm. non-chaotically, right? That could self-reflect on that whole process. So then Darwin is, is brought in and Huxley is Darwin's bulldog that says, okay, the way we're going to explain this scientifically is that we there will assume that there are random mutations on the small that happen beyond the realm of reason. They're just constantly just randomly stochastically changing. And occasionally you get lucky and the dice are rolled just right. So a bigger claw is yeah. gained that edges out the weaker ones who don't have a claw in that system. Hmm. Uh, but it's ultimately a random function causing it. And it's all presumed to be a gradualism. They get rid of any idea that there is no, uh, discover no leaps yeah there, there's there's nothing in, there's no we don't see that in the fossil records we see these leaps in the fossil mm. records they pretend it's all gradualistic changes uh, and this kind of helps reinforce the i guess the notion that it, yeah helps kind of uh, suppress the notion that there might be a god it helps i suppose and it kind of helps um kind of enforce this notion there's nothing special about humans as well i suppose so that yeah well it says right, that, yeah, yeah. It's, it's sort of cut you off i'm sorry but you uh Oh no, it, I was done. I was done. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely does that. And, and it, what it does is it, is it puts the idea of the Hobbesian survival of the fittest doctrine, which was already being refuted by Plato in the Gorgias dialogue 2000 years earlier. But they, it, they basically take this geopolitical assumption of a Leviathan and that the Leviathan comes to power by being the most fit to survive because it suppresses mm. the weak. And it says, look, this is not wrong because we do it because it's there in nature already. Yeah. And, and you can't refute nature, can you? So better adapt to nature and natu yeah. natural law. So like, so therefore yes. you must, you, you know, you need a big break kind of, you need a big brother. Cause if not, there'll be, there'll be savagery as well. And, and the rest of it is that kind of, yeah, like every, this is where the randomness on the small comes in that the value of having the belief in the random uh, function of mut mutating, mutatingness on the, on the small, later becomes you know expressed in in mendelian genetics and other things is that adam smith and and the entire uh, school of british economists including malthus J john stuart mill uh bentham in his own way uh they all basically say value emanates from the the unbound impulses for pleasure and avoidance of pain of each individual part particle of the system Everybody just pursues their own selfish interest and you have a mystical invisible hand creating wealth and self-organizing processes of goodness on the whole, but don't think about it. Vice individual pursuit of vice creates virtue. It's, yeah. at, it's at the heart of the libertarian school as well mm. that became unbounded with Thatcherism and Reaganomics. Um, the result is actually the opposite. You get a homogenization mm. of called globalization where the, the individual diversity is crushed out <laughs> which is what you would get off of. Because I guess like, all our impulses, the thing that's the same between everyone is our impulses, where the things that, that are not, you know, our, our base impulses are where we kind of are aligned with everyone else, where we kind of, you know, the same as everyone else. And we kind of yeah. differ more in the more creative, the more spiritual element, which isn't, um, which isn't really nourished in a really kind of open, easy consumerist society, I suppose. No, like people will tend to make sacrifices that disobey the, the formula of pleasure pain. Like the behaviorist, the person like John Locke, or who believes in a blank slate, who thinks that we're just the sum total of our impulses and adaptability to environments that are controlled for us. They will say as a behaviorist, because they don't believe in soul. They don't believe in that. Mm. They, they will say, all we can do as social engineers governing the behavior is to offer sensual rewards or, or sensual punishments to the, the, the target, the target group. And the problem is when you think in a way that, that involves your sense of conscience, the, the, an, uh, an identity centered around the, the health of your soul, a love of your nation, patriotism, uh, respect for your family. When you do that, you will tend to make sacrifices in the present for the sake of a greater good, right? or you will accept pain in the present for the sake of a greater good. You'll even be willing to suffer, be tortured and die for the sake of a greater good because you couldn't live with yourself if you didn't. And they hate that because mm. <laughs> they need the system to be stochastic, controllable and adaptable to the closed system environment, the machine that they want us to be a part of. Yeah. So that's why they have to get rid of things like religion, the belief in God, the belief in uh, conscience, the belief in soul, the belief mm. in nationalism that has to be purged. So so um, do you think, because I think people find it quite hard to believe how intentional some of this is, right? As in like people, so do you think it's in some ways like a 
sort of more reflective of, of self-interest, right? So people, you know, we have impulses and we rationalize our impulses. And so the impulses for the oligarchs to keep growing, well, these, I suppose, the promotion of certain um, schools of thought that fit into this, they kind of are more reflective of, of the impulse rather than kind of sitting, okay, well, how do we achieve A, would you kind of say it's more of an emergent thing, right? If you if you get if you get where I'm coming from, because I think people you know find it quite hard to believe that it could be so intentional. Everything, right? This whole you know the creation of all these schools of thoughts and how it could be all so beautifully designed. Is it kind of a bit? Yeah. I, you know, I imagine it's is it a bit more chaotic. Is it just more reflection of like with that subconsciously that is what you that is what they'll highlight. That is these are the things that will rise. Given the given the sort of prevailing imperative and the prevailing direction that the powers mm. want things to go, mm. I think that that is a. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about how things often will at first seem complex, but upon deeper reflection, they're not as complex because the complexity or the apparent complexity was at a a, a derivative. A, a, a contingent effect of a wrong way of thinking that we had been trained into adopting mm. by virtue of our having been processed through an education and cultural system. So we, we had certain bad habits of thought. It's, it's like people who um, sometimes, you know, you, I had a friend of mine who was a guitar player and he learned a classical technique of playing the guitar, but he said, and he was a professional, he said he, it was so difficult for him because he had to spend several years deconditioning himself from bad habits in order to learn more natural habits that if he had just gotten that proper experience as a student, he would have been able to accelerate a lot faster than he did. He lost a lot of years. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, I think a little bit of that sometimes that Plato talks about as well with the, uh, the famous allegory of the cave, you know, mm. that at first imagine that we're all a society is, is, is shackled only able to look at the cave and hear sounds and the, the or, or a cave wall and the shadows cast are cast by a fire and puppets are being arranged by an elite who then make sounds, cast the shadows on the wall. And he gives the this, this scenario in book six of the Republic, or is it book seven? I forget. Anyway, uh, of one of these individuals being somehow removed, mm. finding themselves outside of the cave. And at first, it's very difficult to look around at the grass and the trees and the water and everything. And their impulse is to w respond to that pain of the eyes to go back to what's comfortable to them inside of the cave. And he says, but if you're a true philosopher, you will fight through the pain and mm. you'll help your eyes slowly adjust to the higher reality and start feeling over time, not immediately, greater pleasures than you could have experienced when you were living in the illusion world. Mm. And he said, but to be a true, true philosopher means even more than that. It means you have to go back into the cave at the risk of death because people might want to kill you because yeah. you're now going to be trying to a minimal you. getting slapped. Yeah. A minimal getting slapped. It'll get some pain, yeah. but yeah. you have to be willing to, to take that risk despite it all. And, um, but it's more gen it's more enjoyable and more easy to think that way than it was formerly when you were still mm. pitifully believing in the uh, shadows as a reality. So I think that today, when you look at what Thomas Huxley was, brought into was a mode of thinking that was only permitted for an acceptable uh, upper upper echelon of the elite the upper upper level managers who mm. are given a very different education than you would get in your public school yeah um, so you know for students in uh who are who might find themselves among let's say the cambridge apostles at, at cambridge you're going to be getting a very different experience and a different set of training or if you're an oxford road scholar you'll be getting a different set of uh, training in oxford than you would if you were at a community college in California or something. Mm. Um, so coming, what, what Huxley was induced to be a part of, and, and you touched on this uh, by citing in my article, I, I, I call him sort of like a, 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 a management consultant, consultant to, yeah. <laughs> is the empire was becoming too crystallized, too incapable of reacting to the new creative discoveries that were happening on every level of society. And were spreading in the form of, increased nationalist movements everywhere in the world leading up to the, throughout the 1890s. Um, the old techniques weren't, weren't working. So the, the X club was created in 1865 by Huxley, which brought together some of the leading scientists of Britain who were essentially like imperially approved scientists in various fields from chemistry and sociology and economy. And, and Thomas Huxley brought them all together to, to try to create an internally consistent set of, uh, sciences because the, the empire needed to justify itself scientifically. 
Mm. So, and so, so, mm. so, yeah, so just, just to kind of um, wrap up from, from the previous question. So, so the point yeah. being, it is, you know, when we come out of the cave and we find it hard to, to really, um, to see clearly, we find it hard to, we, we kind of want to run away from that. But your point yeah. is that when you come out, you can see quite clearly that things are pretty intentional, that, that there is, that yeah. it is, it is more managed than we would ever care to think. And it's actually more more simple in some ways. Some of these things are going on. Not that reality and the, the deep yeah. questions of life are more simple, but that actually many of these things are not so so random and yeah, like is that, is that is that kind of how there you are know, how you there are intentions. Yeah. We're we're told you're not allowed to think this way if you want to be respected in academia because it's conspiracy theorizing and that's not respectable. That's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that all of history is shaped by ideas and conspiracies of what the future should be for the good and for the bad alike. You yeah. can't understand a single thing about history unless you realize that it's it's a, a a bunch of ideas about what the future should be. So the history is actually a study of the future, mm -hmm. different futures that were competing, right, with different ideals. And, uh, and individuals organizing themselves in a like-minded way mm. uh, to achieve those ends. Um, mm. We are living in history in that sense. And so yeah. it's conspiratorial. And if you, but if you try to, within academia generally, you will be flushed out if you try to even say that. You have to just presume that there's some mechanism yeah. that's acceptable yeah. to the current ruling priesthood that you can just fit everything into your model of history as like whatever there's eco-feminist marxist history yeah where there's whatever like you and people are quite their sense you know particularly ambitious people their senses are quite highly attuned um to you know they're quite dexterous in their pursuit of success right so they're probably they might not even know they've picked up on it but they'll pick up on what is um acceptable what'll get you rewarded what, yeah exactly what's acceptable and what's not um yeah. So, so this kind of closed. So this this X club or whatnot. I suppose this this desire for a managed, a more managed society. I suppose the eugenics, the the transhumanism and stuff. That's that's the other sort of part of the Great Reset, other than the kind of new financial order. That sort of, I suppose, can kind of make it kind of makes sense why that is tied in with that and and kind of how that's that's yeah. helpful as well. And that's why in my trilogy, I, I had to make it a trilogy because it wasn't enough just to get at simply how the, you, the powers that sponsored eugenics and Hitlerism and Nazism and fascism in the 1930s, which were located, I mean, obviously Wall Street banks, city of London banks were massive financial backers to the rise of Nazism. And they were never punished after World War II. Um, but it wasn't just that. It was the science of eugenics. I mentioned the Macy Foundation. There was the Rockefeller Foundation There was that was sponsoring Ernst Rudin's work. And, I, and in, in the, first of my, the first part of my trilogy, I simply get across that these same forces repackaged eugenics, gave it maybe some new names, like Julian Huxley, who cre created UNESCO. I go through a lot of quotes because he's also a leading eugenicist, how he then created uh, transhumanism as a movement, he gave it the name. That's where it comes from is Julian Huxley. Um, but yeah. he also uh, had a major role in shaping the, the next 70 years of the post-war age. And this is there as a theme shaping much of the policymaking of modern uh, biophysics. I find, uh, I found that really helpful. That one thing, yeah. cause you know, for example, people, you know, um, people get quite excited about Elon Musk and people go, is he our guy? Is he not? But when you kind of understand what the direction things are going, the really central part to the kind of, you know, the ruling classes ideology and you kind of, you know, and you yeah. view the kind of imperative for transhumanism, then you kind of realize, well, actually he's, he's perfectly all right. Like he's, he can't be that much of a threat given that he's pioneering Neuralink and stuff. So I found yeah. that kind of helped me kind of dots cross some of these dots. Cause you're kind of going, is he going to be a sort of new, you know, kind of like tech hero Caesar that's going to start a crypto offshoot, of, you know, we're going to like all fly off somewhere together and, and whatnot. And maybe he will, but it kind of helps you understand, kind of provide some context for some of these characters and, yeah, and where they does. fit into the, into the puzzle. Yeah, when you, when you see history as, as organized by ideas, you can mm. then see which players in history, including in our present time, are conduits for which set of ideas. And yeah, he 
Elon Musk unfortunately fails every single litmus test when you apply that that test to what is he a part of? What is he prom- promulgating? Yeah, uh, exactly. Just because he uh, just because he quotes about, tweets about crypto does not mean he's some sort of you know hero no, for the for no, the people. It's an operation. And, and it's very yeah. smart that it's yeah. I, yeah. I always felt he was getting. He was a bit too populist when he started coming on Joe Rogan and stuff. I always felt a bit uneasy about that. I was like, um, it just feels like a bit too eager to please. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and I mean, when you start actually like reading the writings and listening to speeches of people of substance who actually did make creative discoveries and who had like real substance, mm. there, there is something constant you could identify um, within characters of substance, for good or for bad. When you listen to Elon Musk compose his thoughts, you don't see any of that. There is no genuine substance in him that can adequately talk about why he does the things he does. Like, why do you want to go to Mars? Because I want to. It's like, yeah. really? That's why you want to? That's why you're going to devote all of this energy and money and everything? Mm. For, I, I, love go- I love the idea of Mars colonization. I'm totally for it. But I know that you're a Delphic Trojan horse. Because that is not a sufficient reason to motivate you to want to spend all of your energy to do it just because you want to. Mm. Um, no, there's, there's a Trojan horse factor to a lot of this. Mm. But, and it has to do with nation states because the ultimate enemy that's been, that the, the oligarchy has been working hard to subvert all of the foundations of what makes nation states exist mm. as powers that could take away their power. Yeah. And, under the the new space movement of Bezos and Musk and Branson is this idea that we can do everything with no nation states. We could just yeah. have pure market monetary. Uh, because we're going to uh, suppress people's biology, I suppose, ultimately um, because, yeah. you know, like that, that, you know, because that's, you know, all these, all these needs for this need for kin, this need for, for belonging and whatnot. It's just kind of inconvenient um, when you're sitting, I guess, 10,000 miles above just sort of, um, you know, strategically, you know, p- you know, playing chess and, and whatnot, and just very much okay. looking for, you know, looking at your own stuff. So, so you kind of yeah. tie this all together um, with, but you know, back to it. It, kind of, it does it does help make sense of a lot of even like this kind of Prince Philip stuff. Like when he died recently, um, I you know, you kind of look and you see how much he meant in certain people's lives and how active he was in the community. Like the whole like super QAnon caricature, like of you know, just yeah. doesn't make any sense. But again, when you kind of put it in this framing of like, um, you know, you know that he was, you know, if you kind of tr- trace all the way back to Malthus and then Darwin, and you see the ways people think, then you can kind of it kind of ties it together nicely in the sense that he could have, you know, he was active, he could have very much engaged with all these people in the community, but that didn't mean that he he didn't have a vision for where the world needed to go, and that that didn't happen to. That's not yeah. likely to end badly for a bunch of the people. Um, you know, in, in Britain and around the world, I guess. So that mm-hmm. kind of um, tied that together as well. But in ter- so it all, it all makes a lot of sense. When you then look at Russia and China, so this, uh, you know, after the election with Trump. Wait, hold on, hold on. Oh, oh, Before you go into that, oh, let's, let's yeah. just tie one loose end together, okay? Okay, let's do um, it. Just because I, I really want people to drive in their mind. And uh, and again, I, I guess you're going to put the, the links to my, my trilogy in the, the, the video. I will do, yeah. Um, you can't understand the rise of eugenics, how it was reorganized into both transhumanism as well as in the modern environmental movement, which Julian Huxley also created with Prince Philip when he created the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and then World Wildlife Fund with Prince Bernhard and Philip in 61. You can't understand any of that if you don't get the, it's a continuity to the process that was really launched in the form it took with Thomas Huxley's X Club that tried to put into motion a Darwinian approach to everything, a gradualist assumption that the universe has no ultimate directionality it's governed by randomness ultimately uh that you have to assume exists even Mm. if evidence shows you otherwise you have to ignore your senses of of apparent order and assume that that randomness is what's causing that order uh so you're turning your mind off you're or at least you're turning your reason off Mm. and then um we see with uh darwin's uh, the application of Darwinism to social settings in the form of different schools of thought, namely uh, Herbert Spencer, who's a, um, a dining member of the X Club, who's applying it to his ideas and theories of social Darwinism, that the, the weak will be edged out by the, the strong in societal terms, as well as Galton, who's taken it further to the, the self-conscious uh, cleansing of the human gene pool in eugenics. 
Uh, so Sir, and Sir Francis Galton goes on to to be a real big advocate, saying that this is going to replace all the world religions. This is going to be the new religion. Mm -hmm. uh, Keynes, again, to re remind the audience, Keynes is a major member, a, a treasurer of the Eugenic Society. The Galton Institute is what the the British Eugenic Society it had a name change in the eighties, become the Galton Institute. This is tied. Whitney Webb did some amazing research, which I've published on on my websites. Uh, called uh, or republished um, on the Gavi connection and an Oxford AstraZeneca uh, connection to the Galton Institute, which has direct connections as, as do many other eugenics organizations that did name changes uh, to be part of the current um, programs today for vaccine development, but also strange things that are tied to the CRISPR uh, innovations, the, pro the projects that emanated out of the Human Genome Project. Mm that were run by people like Sir Eric Lander, the, the Oxford Rhodes Scholar from the United States, who's now the US science czar, who ran the Human Genome Project, which is professing to, again, it's, it's tied into, it offers itself very well to transhumanist thinking because they're like now for the first time, everything's been random up until now. And Yuval Harari mm. from the World Economic Forum, this, this philosopher, he, um, he's of the, you know, he's constantly saying that everything's been random purposelessness up until now, but finally we can introduce order and the new, uh, intelligent designers will not be God of the future, but they're going to be the CEOs of Facebook and Google. And, you know, he's, he's trying to kiss ass to his, his sponsors. Yeah. Um, all that to say, that's the continuity. I just need people. I really, mm. really encourage people to try to work through and prove this to themselves that there is this continuity of ideas that they can own and not just repeat or parrot without mm. really working it through and take some time before you talk about it. Cause that does a lot of damage when people try to talk about things they don't understand. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, I just want to say that before well, I move on. Yeah. Yeah. No, no definitely. I, I have a habit of, 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 of making leaps and yeah, it's important to, to, to make this very thorough um, because yeah, it, it does tie a lot of stuff together. Once you, you know, once you really, you know, sit with it. And once you, um, you kind of connect to the dots and you, a lot of this stuff can be substantiated. That's the thing. That's the other encouraging thing about this stuff. Some of yeah. this other stuff you read online, but this stuff, you you know, you're quoting what people are saying. You can find the documents and that's, you know, that's why this is, you know, people really need to, um, this is a really good piece of the information world, right? Yeah. <laughs> For people to yeah. work on. Um, yeah, definitely. So I'm glad you did that. <laughs> if you want to talk about the present situation now a little bit, we can end on that if you want. Um, yeah. So in terms of, in terms of kind of just tying it all together, because with um, people, have, you know, w with the, the election in, in the U S um, even people like Steve Bannon who were getting kicked off Twitter, you know, they're, they're very much framing China um, as, as the enemy. We're looking at the sort of so social credit system that's kind of coming on the back of likely to come on the back of the vaccine. And we see that China are doing that. Um, and so there has been this temptation to to kind of look at them as being almost them being the sort of head of the universe. The, yeah, yeah. The, them sort of, you know, there's this notion that they kind of took over from the US. It was Britain, then the US, and that's China who are head of the, the unipolar. But that's somewhat of a myth from what I understand. And um, can you yeah, talk a little bit about their vision at, and, and, and Russia's vision? And I suppose, mm -hmm. you know, and then we can kind of end on, um, I've, got, I've got another quick question around that, but just kind of lay that, lay that out for us. It would be fantastic. Sure. And you don't have any time constraints, right? Like if I go oh, on. No, we, we, we can keep going. I'm really enjoying yeah. this. So okay, um, cool. <laughs> it's just long. It, it's going to end up longer than my usual ones, but I think I'm, I'm enjoying it so much. So let's. Um, okay. Let's, let's, let's follow it up. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so the uh, we're, we're, we're in, we're in the realm of the, of a Byzantine world, okay? Like people have to situate themselves in not the world as it appears, but the world as it is. There's mm -hmm. a difference. On the appearance of things, which is not very important if you believe in truth, it would seem as though we live in democracies here in the transatlantic community where we represent Western liberal values expressed in NATO and you know globalization and, that's, and we have democracies. And then you have the the tyrannical uh, systems of the East, especially of China, but also of Russia that are authoritarian personalities. Uh, and, uh, and that's, that's antagonistic to Western values. Now the reality, especially if anybody's listened to this whole conversation we've had or have, have watched your previous interviews with, with other individuals, 
uh, they're aware that we do, that's an illusion. The reality is that we do not have democracies. We have some residues from democratic mechanisms that were fought for in the past, but we live under a very, very tightly controlled five eyes Bank of England run uh, oligarchy. These are the, the physical, you know, aspects of the real power structure of the oligarchy. And unlike what we've been taught in our popular history books that, um, you know, the British empire disappeared after world war II, And then you, now we had the American empire. That is not true. What the hell killed Kennedy? What was Kennedy fighting to stop in, in the United States? What killed his brother, Robert? What was, what was his brother, Robert trying to extricate from the United States? And what was he trying to do by restoring a certain foreign policy of development, of helping nations stand on their own two feet in South mm. America and Africa? That's what both Kennedy brothers were doing. What was Roosevelt doing? Why was his plans for a U.S.-China-Russia alliance of global development projects, why was that sabotaged with his early death? And why did the Wall Street power structure, which came in and flooded and created the CIA, disbanded the OSS, purged the U.S. of all of its patriots, what was it representing? Was that, was that the real America that became the American empire? Or is there something that was killing these different presidents going back? There's been eight presidents who died in office from only 17. I mean, the first one died in office. It was Harrison in 1840. What was Harrison doing? Right. What was, what was Lincoln doing? What was Garfield doing? What was McKinley doing? What was Harding, Harding doing? What was JFK doing? What was FDR mm -hmm. doing? They were all doing the same thing. If you look at the policies and you look at the ideas that they were fighting for, it's a continuity, just like we've been de dealing with this continuity so far. Um, <clears throat> so it's not the case that the U.S. The, the U.S. became the empire. It's that this thing inside of the U.S. that was always there since 1776, there was something that never left the USA mm. since 1776. Some, it, just some... managed, it just managed to, to gain supremacy. It was always... It was always there. It was always kind of trying to get influence. Yeah, you 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 realize when you read this. Um, when you read, uh, I, I, G. Edward Griffin was on, um, mm -hmm. and his book Creature of Jekyll Island, and yeah. it starts with the foundation of the Federal Reserve in 1913. But what you realize when when reading the book is, yeah, I mean, there's a to and f there's a toing and froing, and there's a back and forth, and there's a there's a there's a tug of war going right from the beginning. People trying to implement central banking and fiat currency and, and the rest of it. Well, look at, so, yeah, look, yeah. Look at like, Aaron Burr, right? Like the Aaron Burr was the guy who uh, created Wall Street, like the Bank of Manhattan, which was the foundation for Wall Street, was created by Aaron Burr, the vice president, who basically laundered money from the government to create a speculative enterprise that should have gone into building waterworks and water infrastructure. He instead used that to create a bank that was based on speculation instead of national improvements. And after killing Hamilton and being caught red-handed at the heart of a conspiracy to break up the, the U.S. into a northern and southern confederacy in 1804, and then he tried to do it again in, uh, with a western confederacy that he was supposed to become king of, he was found at the heart of this conspiracy in, again, 1807. There was a, a warrant on his arrest. To avoid arrest, what does Aaron Burr do? The guy who, who creates Wall Street? He runs off to British Canada where he... His, his nephew is now the governor general of Canada um, and he gets a, a ship under, in disguise to go off to London where he lives for five years in Jeremy Bentham's house doing all sorts of sordid orgiastic stuff with Bentham, the nasty, you know, hedonistic calculus guy. Yeah. We talked about in defense of pederasty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before he's then sent back into the United States during the, uh, at the beginning of the, uh, the War of 1812 in order to run a new type of operation now that people have forgotten what he did somehow, um, which involves recreating a new deep state inside of the United States, which runs assassinations of, of pretty much, it grows as a parasite within, um, which tries to break up the United States in, in 1860-61. Um, and luckily you had some creative moral people who sacrificed to stop that from it did. But point being is yeah, you've got, you don't just have one America, you've got two Americas at war with itself. And one of them is a British controlled operation from within that never gave up its loyalty to the, uh, the higher hereditary powers of the elite. Mm. So this is the thing today that people have to recognize is this is a dominant force. Donald Trump, I think, did legitimately try as a non-establishment figure to push against that. Mm. I think he meant it. I, don't, I think he made a lot of mistakes along the way. 
But nonetheless, that was the last real resistance I think was there since, since maybe Bobby Kennedy died. Um, and that's what's running. That, that species character is what's running the NATO Western neoliberal system that's trying to get us all to become convinced that the real enemy is not that, mm. that thing that ran a color revolution inside of the United States. Yeah. They're trying to say, no, it's all Russia or it's all China. And there's a variety of narratives that have been created that are mm. absorbing people on the left as well as on the right into both uh, theories, which are, are, they ignore the reality that, yes, China has problems. Yes, Russia has yeah. problems. Well, I think that's the thing people can, people, you can get kind of simplistic in, in your thinking and that you kind of go, oh, we're bad. And then people go, people then kind of, jump and go oh well then that must mean china and russia are these heroes and then you find out they're not you know there's always there's always a bit of nuance right and so there's nuance yeah yeah I there's mean, always the, nuance the, so the they thing, the, the yeah. thing to keep in mind is that the, the the driving force of this evil is the thing that that has wanted to both destroy the united states as well as destroy russia and destroy china for the past 150 200 plus years mm. it's the same thing that wants to destroy all of these things and um like for example they were able to nation strip the United States. As I, as I mentioned, we talked about earlier with the creation of the consumer society outsourcing of industry. They wanted to do the same thing in the 1980s with China, right? They had their George Soros, Gorbachev of China as the, uh, the secretary general of the CP, CCP, uh, Zhao Jiang. Zhao yeah. Jiang was the guy that he ran a think tank in China with George Soros in the 1980s. He mm. brought in Milton Friedman. He brought in... Uh, he wanted to bring in shock therapy the way Gorbachev was doing as a traitor to Russia with Yeltsin in, uh, in Russia. The thing is, r the Russians at the time didn't have the ability to recognize what was going on until it was too late. And the 1990s was a rape, which Russia is still recovering from. Thank God that Putin was able to sort of start bringing in a real nationalism in that sense yeah. to begin to, to recover. Mm. Whereas China was wise enough, especially after uh, Zhao Jiang was discovered to be at the heart of a, of a CIA-run operation to uh, create Tiananmen Square. And they didn't tolerate him anymore. They ousted him as, as, as general secretary of the CCP. They uh, put him in permanent exile of house arrest till, he, to, till the day he died. George Soros was illegalized. He was banned from China. They shut down all of the Soros operations, the brainwashing of young Chinese economists into Milton Friedman thinking they, they, they banished them. They all came to the, to New York and Canada where they set up operations like e epoch times and other yeah. things are currently being used to brainwash the Westerners mm. uh, under a new enemy image. They're still there. They, I mean, the British are the ones that are, have been trying very hard since that time to, to force China to have a private central bank. China is the only country that rejected Zhao Ziyang's desire to privatize their central bank the way Russia had done. And that um, still remains to this day. So, to this that, day. so, so the, the Steve Bannon take on like CCP and whatnot, that's, is that, that's look, a bit simplistic. Steve as well. Bannon is, look, to understand Steve Bannon as a, as a, as a counterintelligence operation, you got to look at his role in the uh, Dignitas uh, Humanitae Institute, um, which is a Habsburg, an auto, an auto Habsburg founded uh, think tank in uh, uh, Italy, which, uh, is a major black nobility controlled think tank. You could just look at the people who are the patrons of this. Um, Steve Bannon is the nominal head of this thing. He was brought in to revive um, a certain school of fascism um, in Europe to create a new collect the unite the right against uh, Islam and against Confucianism. So it's a, it's a new repackaging of a clash of civilizations dogma, mm -hmm. which people rejected under the neocons because it, it became pretty obvious in how ugly it was but he's repackaging it for conspiracy theorists um, as well as people who just generally reject the neo the neoliberal ethic, which is evil of just, there are no, there are no truths, right? It's all just accept everything. Yeah. So people reject that because they're, they're healthy human beings, but then they're absorbed into this new umbrella organization. So there's things like that. There's things like Falun Gong, which is again, another intelligence operation as a synthetic controlled sort of Scientology of Asia with which tried to run a certain type of a color revolution in the 1990s, which was expelled and justifiably so um, in 97 or 98 in China. And Falun Gong is run by a guy who believes that he's the Messiah who's communicating with aliens, kind of mm -hmm. like L. Ron Hubbard. 
yeah. um, giving people special powers to heal themselves with no, you know, no medicine. And this is used on the surface to be like a meditation group of, of like Qigong, but not really. There's something more nefarious that is controlling it that most of the members are not even aware of that's being used to fund things like Epoch Times, fund a lot of the, I mean, there's a whole international web yeah. of the operations that, are, that have deployable narratives to misdirect people into realizing that it's not George Soros or it's not British intelligence at the heart of the election scam in the U.S. that ran a uh, color revolution. They'll say it's China because some of the hardware can be traced to China. Yeah. Or they'll say it's not the 200 U.S. bioweapons labs scattered around the world that have anything to do with COVID that was already packaged out in the 2010 Rockefeller Foundation lockstep scenario game. They'll say, don't look at any of that. It's China because of this one piece of evidence of some gain of function research Mm. of $600,000 tied to the Wuhan lab. They'll say this receipt from Fauci, and don't get me wrong, I love to make fun of Fauci. I think the guy's an asshole. But, they're, but they're, they're, he's also expendable. He's disposable when he's not useful. And when they have a higher prize, like, for example, blame China for everything, mm. then he's, they, will get rid of, they will throw Fauci to the Jacobin mobs to get his head cut off if it's more expedient. Yeah. Um, so that's what you have right now. But mm. the reality is when you look at what China and Russia together are doing with the Belt and Road Initiative, the Polar Silk Road, which is the Arctic expression of the Belt and Road, is they've created a completely alternative financial, political, economic security architecture that also involves increasingly Iran, 135 nations. A lot of them are in Africa, 17 in South America and the Caribbeans have signed on to the Belt and Road framework. It's funded by national banking institutions. It's not controlled by the IMF and World Bank. And it's doing things that empires don't do. So I'm not a fan of social credit, okay? Yeah. Soros likes, when, when Soros or Tony Blair or Kissinger say nice things about China, what they mean to say is we like those things that involve centralized social control that we can use. Yeah. They like that part. They don't like everything that China is actually doing as far as encouraging population growth. Yeah. Uh, the development of full spectrum industrial economies in Africa, the training of labor forces to develop real skill sets in Nigeria and Congo. They hate that. That's that's illegal in any empire. So they're mind. building these they're building these countries up to be independent. Yeah, you could just look at these wonderful videos going through and just I mean, just talk to people who, who live there. Um, they're actually seeing hope for the first time. Of, they're seeing like real development happening mm. in front of their eyes. And it's only when you read our like, western controlled like propaganda outlets that you start getting a different narrative saying that they're they're doing debt trap diplomacy or yeah no they, no they're really they're really not at all it's provably the case that they're not doing that we've been doing that yeah <laughs> the past like 100 plus years we've been already doing that yeah the one, thing I, the one thing i didn't i couldn't quite level was you know this notion that um russia china that's much more inclusive of um Na the notions of national sovereignty in the sense that you know russia and china are kind of empires of themselves right kind of over the over those territories they're they're they they kind of are consolidating um the a kind of you know a, a rule a, a concept of a of a of a nation that sits far above the level of the self-identifying people Would well there's that? always the problem is infinite divisibility um so the thing in mathematics is everything every system can be infinitely div divisible you know, mm -hmm. um, to no end. And yeah. you define nationality simply around ethnic divides uh, of some sort or linguistic divides. There should be more of something like 30,000 countries on the earth today. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in terms of real geopolitical um, usefulness, that's only useful doing that and dividing a world to be conquered to that degree if you are one of the real power centers that want to dominate the world. Um, you like having an easily divided, you know, micro micronation world and mm -hmm. like Zbigniew Brzezinski even pointed it out in his 1997 grand chessboard um he's got graphs uh maps of the Russia that he foresees as being uh necessary to bring into being which is a Russia divided into like three smaller confederations right um mm -hmm. and then a highly expanded NATO that's absorbed all of the, the former Soviet space nations um <clears throat> China as well. They, they, the CIA and NED have sponsored reports that have showcased what China should look like over the years. And there's many different images of these going back to the 80s. 
of not China today, but like a China that's divided into like eight sub nations. It's easier, it's easier to run divide and conquer, essentially. Is that, is that, part yeah, of like one is called you're... Xinjiang is no longer Xinjiang, it's East Turkestan, and Free Tibet now becomes the yeah. parliament of Tibet, and then Hong Kong is its own thing, Taiwan is its own thing, uh, Guangdong is its own thing, because they're all if, like locally divisible ethnic majorities in these zones. Yeah. And the intention isn't to really empower local small groups. That's not the intention for is those. Is that people. happening? Is that. Is that happening in China or are they not thinking about that at all? I'm just thinking in terms of the, the centralization of plan, is, like, is there federalism? Is there a sort of respect for local authority? Is there a sort of sovereignty? Because obviously we're talking about the British Empire having this antithesis of this idea of sovereignty and that being problematic for them. Well, are, are I... Russia and China, are they kind of respectful of that at all? They have uh, a within, within the context, to- yeah. They have a zero tolerance policy towards foreign operations breaking up their their nation. Like they've got very set uh, national boundaries that they've defined as being like red zones, uh, mm-hmm. red lines that foreign powers should not be trying to break up or use to uh, undermine them. So that's very clear. The, but the thing about Russia and China, I'll just point out, you know, empire, again, it, it, some of the terms we're using are, are tough, but if you look at the U.S., it has about a thousand foreign military bases outside of its own borders, two hundred, and it has two hundred bio bioweapons labs. Yeah, China has one military base outside of its borders mm-hmm. in Djibouti. One. Um, it's a very different way of interacting with the foreign world outside yeah. of its borders. That's now, not, yeah, that's uh, useful. Russia's that- defense budget is one tenth of U.S.'s defense budget. Mm-hmm. But it's more effective at it, it's spending because it, 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 it's, it's wiser. It's not just going for bulk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. The other thing to keep in mind is that um, if you actually look at the things like on the ground measurable, there's measurable characteristics of human life that you can look at and measure over time to see if a policy has been what the policy intention is. Um, in the case of Xinjiang, for example, with the Uyghurs, we know certain things like the fact that the GDP has quintupled over a very short period of time of only about 25 years and the standard of life has also increased. They do have about 260 uh, mosques in uh, Xinjiang. Mm-hmm. Um, there are the problem of, and here is where people have to look at the Saudi CIA operations that were really got into, into uh, got underway in a heavy way under Zbigniew Brzezinski of the Trilateral Commission in the late 90, uh, 70s, where U.S. foreign policy began to fund radical uh, madrasas and, in order to fight the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. And their mm-hmm. policy became to use radical, the most radicalized Wahhabi Islam, the School of Islam, as a battering ram or a weaponized tool against the Soviets in the Cold War. And mm-hmm. they created a monster and that they never stopped using this thing to destroy and undermine nations that really got underway after 9-11, right? And they undermined all of the most moderate, ironically, the most moderate nations that were actually doing something to stop Al-Qaeda, like like Iraq, Libya, Syria. Um, They were ecumenical nations for the most part. I mean, uh, they weren't like the Saudi uh, royal family's uh, uh, governance at all. But these were all turned upside down and uh, these different terrorist groups were trained, funded. A lot of them were uh, Uyghurs, uh, radicalized mm-hmm. Uyghurs who had been trained by Saudi funded mosques um, in their own, in, in Xinjiang. And there were several hundred terrorist attacks throughout the nineties into the 2014 in China that mm-hmm. killed thousands of people. And we were often not told about that. Yeah. So I guess that, problem is, yeah, I guess people get confused because um, there's this critique on um, let's say sort of like, in, independent minded people they, they look at you know they, they they have this caricature of you know we've discussed we've dispelled somewhat about china controlling the west and stuff but they kind of look at the mainstream media not reporting on certain elements of, of china you know certain elements of how china have treated the the Uyghur, um population and stuff like that and that's something that so there's there is this notion sometimes that the media doesn't often report and you'd think that if they were if they were, you know, if they if they wanted to attack, undermine China, that some of these things would get more of a platform. Although I do, I think the Wigan well, stuff. Honestly, I would say that they are reporting it. Like I, I'm, I follow left and right mainstream media as well, just to see how people mm. are being, how the zeitgeist is being shaped. And yeah. yeah, I see a lot of reporting. In fact, the whole Canadian Parliament unanimously condemned China as a genocide country mm. uh, for 
like the U.S. Par- uh, Congress did it, the Senate did it, European governments have done it. They've passed official, like, highly popular sanctioning of China for genocide. Yeah. Which, um, yeah, I'd say that's the opposite of what you would. Uh, <laughs> no, for, yeah, no, that's that's yeah. yeah I, I, the the Wigger stuff, yeah, i have just that's that's something that I've picked up on. Is that's a, definitely an opinion that people have, right? On this sort of independent media is like, oh, they're in a bed with China because they would be they do more reporting. But anyway, um, we'll, you know, perhaps, there's there's a perhaps program to conflict. break up Russia, China, and every nation and to create a world of small micro nations defined purely by ethnicity as a local local little mini groups that were highly balkanized in order to be dominated by a hegemon and, yeah, and kept yeah. perpetually fighting each other and that's that is the formula of hundreds thousands of years ago it's still the formula in practice today and if you're if you're not if you don't investigate the US and anglo uh, operations targeting both countries including into the present, how the underground churches, some of them are, are good, some of them are nefarious. They're covers mm-hmm. for NED CIA operations to infiltrate and undermine uh, China, which also, if you don't have that in your mind or the CIA's relationship to the Dalai Lama, um, going back to the, the 50s, if you don't mm-hmm. have those, those things in your yeah, mind, yeah. it's easy to fall for a lot of the narratives that are being fed to us to create these enemy images or to not understand where China's coming from. Like, why are they, yes, they don't have a democracy, but it's like, it, are they the evil dictator or are they, do they have to have a heavy hand right now because there are so many current active operations that they need for the moment, at least to have this heavy hand to mm. stop themselves from disintegrating. Yeah. They, I, I get, I get your point when you, when you understand the, the nature of the challenges they're facing, the nature of the trade offs, they have to face a bit better yeah, you can kind of get a, a yeah, you get a, a sort of a, a sort of more nuanced nuanced take on the whole thing, yeah. and so and and what it, and so I guess they in terms of their more open vision, that's a chance for them to, I guess to to increase their influence as well. I suppose like you know Russia and, and China. That's what's that's how it's aligned with their incentives in the sense that um, yeah, they're not angels. They're not they're not doing everything altruistically. They're they're just yeah. operating on a higher. Uh, a higher sense of, of self-interest, which is not to divide and conquer the world. They they're basically provide, saying like, we need resources. We need to provide value as well, I suppose. Like they yeah, need, exactly. they're at the stage where they need to generate value. They need to generate innovation. They're at earlier stage in the cycle where this stuff is important. And that's how you build relationships, cooperation and whatnot. And until you, you know, only once you've really got your reach everywhere, you start corrupting. That's when it's possible. Yeah. Um, the, the, the thing that, I think is the, the, the empire has been trying to smother for a very long time the idea of the general welfare as an organizing principle. Like the idea of, in the case uh, of, of the West, there was something very important called the Peace of Westphalia mm-hmm. that gave birth to the modern nation state. You've heard of it, right? Yeah. So the Westphalian principle was actually what gave that vitality, the reason why it put an end to the religious wars that were all orchestrated religious wars being funded by Venice of the 16... 16- 19 to 1648 period was that it was premised around the first article, which was the benefit of the other that now, and also number two, article two was the forgiveness of past transgressions. These two principles of the idea that from this point forward, are, we will see our self-interest as being based upon the self-interest and defensive self-interest of our neighbor, despite the fact of the, the past hostilities we've had together. And number three, that made this thing work under Colbert and uh, Mazarin, who are the, the architects of this in France, the finance minister of France, was the investment into infrastructure and great canals, public works to develop internal uh, development in the uh, German zone, uh, as well as in France. And by building these things that, that like a canal would cross over the territories of many different interests that formerly had, were enemies, you create a higher sense that by working together, we can create a higher value that is more uh, guaranteed to create stability and greater income, ironically as well, for both ourselves and our kids. Yeah. And so that's, that's good business. It's not pure angel behavior. It's just, it's good common sense business that happens to be tied to personal self-interest, personal profits yeah. will be maintained mm-hmm. as well as the greater good of the whole. Now, China and Russia nearly as the foundation of the multipolar alliance, because they're both saying that the, that the new financial system cannot be unipolar, it must be multipolar. 
both of these countries. The principle that they're saying is got to be defended is the principle of the nation state embedded in the UN Charter of 1946. Now, inside the UN Charter, it's a mixed bag, but it's not like the League of Nations. The League of Nations, earlier from 1919, mm. was a British roundtable world government concoction to get rid of nation states. Yeah, That's yeah. what the League of Nations was. That's what Roosevelt sabotaged. Mm. What Roosevelt organized to create with the United Nations, and which the British oligarchy tried to corrupt and take over, and they largely did a good job of that for the most part, but it's embedded in the Charter, is the enshrinement of the sovereignty of nations. It wasn't supposed to be ever a, an enforcement authority. And that enshrinement of the sovereignty of nations was, in, was a reflection of the, the Westphalian Charter, yeah. the respective borders of your neighbor. So, so this is, yeah, and this is and this is being respected by by Russia and China, and, and that's evidenced yeah. by their operations abroad, where it's not based on military; it's based on actually helping people economic development. And, and exactly, they, they don't have to force their system. And, and for people who say that China is just trying to like trick everybody into adopting their communist system around the world to replace Western values, which is the the common narrative that I encounter, name me one country of the 135 who have signed on to the Belt and Road Framework, doing business with China. Name me one of them who have had to adopt the Chinese Communist Party system in their country? None. You can't find any because they're not doing it. They're respecting the development pathways of these various countries, despite the fact that one could say, okay, they ignore human rights abuses or local corruption problems in Ecuador or Nigeria. Because honestly, they don't. their main objective is to get projects done that bear fruit. Hmm. Their, their job is not to do what, what George Soros and, you know, the uh, virtue signaling assholes here in the West are doing with the International Criminal Courts or Human Rights Watch by, like, chastising bad, pe- bad behavior in small countries yeah. and not allowing any investments to go into those countries' development. We're, we're, we're giving them loans to make them debt slaves, but we're not allowing them to develop. Mm. China's doing the opposite. They're saying, okay, look, you got your problems. <laughs> you got your fucking criminal activity. You got your problems. You got your bribes. We'll play whatever, whatever games, whatever rules are in your local zone. Okay, whatever. Let's just get this bridge built. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's just build your school to train your engineers in Sudan. Mm. And, uh, and it bears longer term fruit. So I just say. Yeah, no, I've, just been, I've, been, yeah, I've just been driving that just to, you know, because I think, you know, like I said, people can tend, um, you can get quite binary in your view, right? So then you're kind of going, oh, so. Okay, first step. Okay, we're actually pretty terrible. We have been pretty terrible. Um, then you're kind of looking at China, and you and then and you you know you read you know you read your article, and it's tempting to switch that and go, oh my god, they're the good guys. But then if you then switch to that view, and then you then sort of, I'm sure I'm sure that there's some unpleasant stuff happening there. So then you yeah. you see that, and then you kind of then you kind of jump straight back, right? So it's I'm just trying process. to like, process. I, I, that's process. what I'm saying. I'm trying to like, I'm trying to ha- hammer out the nuance yeah. and 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 so it's a process. It's true. Yeah. And, and can we say that China is not never going to be corrupt, uh, or that there is no corruption there? No, we can't say that. Yeah. Um, we can't say that there's a formula for success. It's it's a question of are you moving in a directionality? Like there's everything is a process. It's not a fixed static state. Mm-hmm. So right now, as a process, if I if I look at Eurasia, and I look at where is it going and where is it coming from, right? Look at the, the quality yeah. of life, the standards of living, the longevity, the optimism in the people, the drug use. If I look at all of these v- variables, the division of labor even, is that increasing or decreasing? I could see on all of those measurable parameters, we have measurably verifiable increases of progress, of things that getting, are getting better. Yeah. Whereas if yeah. I look at the same, I, I apply those same parameters to my part of the world that I'm living in here in the transatlantic, mm drug use going up, suicide rates going up, depression going up, jobs going down, collapsing of infrastructure, uh, increased rates of, I mean, every, every measurable parameter is, is going in the wrong direction. Yeah. So if you were, we're heading towards dark age there, at least they've got a momentum in a different direction and can it be subverted? Sure. But yeah. like, we got to just take a step back here and realize how we're being played as well to, to, cause ironically, here's the biggest irony is that, China and Russia together by defending these principles, these Westphalian principles and engaging in state directed credit, like national banking, that's not run by private, private uh, oligarchs to build lar- large scale infrastructure is ironically much more American. If you mm. take the America of, you know, John F. Kennedy, Roosevelt, Lincoln, McKinley, yeah. it's much more American than America today. Yeah. So uh, that's an irony to sort of just chew on a little bit. And uh, the second irony as well to keep in mind is that, um, 
well, not irony. I mean, think, keep in mind is that when Kissinger went to China to export the U.S. because they needed China for the formula of of stripping the U.S. and the West of its manufacturing, they needed China to be the dirty sweatshops to produce the cheap stuff for the West. Mm. That was part of the formula for this Morlock LOI, you know, master slave society of have, or at least haves and have nots with the middlemen controlling the levers in between the financiers. Um, he wanted, he liked Mao's gang of four as the perpetual China ethic. Mao's gang of four did the cultural revolution. It was a disaster, really yeah. bad. Mm. Um, a lot of Chinese are still traumatized by what they had to go through under that. Now, and there's whole skull and bones Princeton stuff. That's he, tied to yeah, this he well. got funding. Yeah, he, yeah, he got a lot of funding from the banking interests. And, and exactly whatnot, right? what they yeah. often miss, though, is that Mao is not like that whole period of, of the the uh, the Cold War is not something you could just take as a binary thing. There were enemies to the Gang of Four within the Communist Party, namely Xu and Lai. Mm. Xu and Lai at different times with the Premier of China and had influence on Mao. Mao would vacillate between these two camps that were enemies. Zhu Enlai had a whole network built up who wanted to work on things like breaking colonialism by building the Bandung conferences with Africa. Um, the Tanzanian rail projects had a lot to do with the Zhu Enlai groups, not really much to do with the Gang of Four. The Gang of Four were much more, they ran the Cultural Revolution, like I said. Mao was, had an egotistical God complex and was very susceptible Again, sometimes to it was like Louis the Fourteenth, right? Mm. Louis the Fourteenth was insane. But if you want to understand what Mao was, look at Louis the Fourteenth and how sometimes under Colbert, as his first minister, he would do he would be do good things. But under other courtiers who would inflame his ego or uh, mm. flattery, he would do terrible things. Uh, especially when he had his Jesuit confessors that he was that were like guiding him. Um, Mao was kind of like that. Um, now, Kissinger wanted that cultural revolution to be a perpetual forever thing mm. with now China just having sweatshops. Now, the, when Mao died, the Gang of Four lost their protection. And what happened to them? They were all sent to prison mm. where they died and over years. The Zhu Enlai faction, his, Zhu Enlai's key guy was Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping and Zhu Enlai had a very different idea that was much more farsighted than Kissinger even realized. He thought he could induce them to keep that policy going, which is what I mentioned that guy, uh, Zhu Jiang, who became the, uh, the Soros man, the, the, the Gorbachev of China. Mm, yeah. He was supposed to be that, to return it back to that. Mm. So there's this battle within China, their leadership that has to be more, nobody that I talk to knows about this really. Very few people appreciate this. But if you don't appreciate that, you can't understand anything about what China is today. Uh, you know, so... Which is ironically, again, it's more, it's a revival of the Sun Yat-sen, the founder of China, of modern China that overthrew the dynastic system in 1911, was a Christian named Sun Yat-sen, the first president of China. It was a, it was, he modeled the Chinese Republic off of Lincoln's three principles of the people, for by and of the people. Yeah, that, I remember, yeah, yeah, that's something that a lot of people wouldn't, wouldn't guess, right? And it's no, important. It, yeah, it is important for people to connect with that because, like we were saying, there are broad bro there are broad themes through history, and you know this notion of you know the, you know the greenback dollar. There was also something called the Bradbury Pound in in the UK, mm -hmm. from, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. This investment in infrastructure, um, this kind of protecting you know protecting your people, you know, yeah. raising the minds of the people and stuff like that. Yeah. If that is happening, if that is you know, those forces still exist in in the West. And if there are, if, if, you know, countries like China and Russia are pushing those ideas, then we should look to sort of open those up. We should look to engage, you know, as, yeah, much, as, that, as, as much as that, as much as that will be shut down, obviously it's important, to, you know, as much as that will, you know, be sabotage or whatever, I guess it's important for us to be open to these things, to be connecting these dots um, because they're not completely disconnected, right? As in we have th yeah. these ideas, they th these philosophies, um, they will very much still be, um, you know floating around uh, we just need to kind of rekindle them and connect you know and and sort of yeah and improve the yeah, dialogue exactly. to the extent that we can exactly um, and, and one of the things that kept europe in a dark age one of the characteristics is these wars of civilizations the the crusades against mm -hmm. the heathens the heretics of the turks you know that's that was always orchestrated by the the venetians the bankers in the middle who wanted to destroy everybody that's yeah, what they yeah. follow the steve bannon paradigm to its logical conclusion it will result in a global 
modern clash of civilizations between the Christian West and the Confucian Chinese uh, East and the Muslims of the, it's, it's a, it's, it's a total dark age paradigm that's being set up to absorb people into. Yeah. Um, it won't end well. So you really have to do like what, which, what president Sun Yat-sen did. He looked for the best. He was a Confucian. He was a Christian and real Confucians and real Christians. And I would even say real humanist uh, Muslims all see the same thing. They resonate with each other. They recognize the same thing, a certain love of a common characteristic of a loving God that made us in his image, that gave us the ability to create and to make things better for our kids after we die, to be aware of our mortality, uh, to be held accountable to our conscience. Yeah. And so that's why you can, you can uh, get along really well with different religions, different people of different faiths who all have tapped into that and can put aside their, the ritualistic differences that set them apart. Mm. And it's, it's only by getting us to focus on our ritualistic sort of veneer differences that we are induced to fight each other for the benefit of the oligarchy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so, so what do you, what do you want? What's your kind of vision or what do you, what, or your, or your, you know, I guess your, you know, your plan or your thoughts or your message sort of, what do you, what is it, you know, you, you obviously, um, I've read a book or two and you obviously have written an article or two and you, you know, you have a deep understanding of a lot of, a lot of this stuff kind of what's your take on what we need to do. And, and f- from the Western perspective, what are you kind of, what message are you trying to get out to people? Well, I think before you and I started this conversation, we had a little, a little bit of a chat regarding the need to uh, provide substance because if you have people who put into action uh, impulses that are not defined by wisdom, you will get either, um, a dissolution of that movement very quickly under its own disenchantment. Disenchantment. So if you don't have a Martin Luther King, the civil rights movement doesn't work, you know? But Martin Luther King what dif- distinguishes him as a real leader of substance is that he tried to create leaders. He tried to awaken. You could hear it in his sermons, right? Go online and listen to 10 or 12 Martin Luther King sermons. Just listen to them Re- or read them if you can only find transcripts. He's providing an intellectual, moral, philosophical uh, mass education for people of all, no matter how educated or uneducated you are, you will walk out of that a more wise person who can build on a firmer foundation than you could have previous to. And he's trying to create leaders yeah. in, in, in every member within the movement. Uh, bad leaders like sounding good. They might sound like, you know, they must use the art of rhetoric to persuade like an Obama might use it, but they have no intention or ability or desire to create uh, qualified sovereign people, civ- citizens that are qual- qualified to think on broader terms or act accordingly to their conscience. So I think the thing that we have to do right now, number one, is provide a conducive environment for people to expand their wisdom, to seek and, and develop their internal compass a lot more efficiently. Mm. Um, and that's that's something which we, I mean, I, I started a foundation with my wife called the Rising Tide Foundation in order to be part of this process or to create an environment of education, curriculum building, um, with a focus on lectures, study groups. We have a lot of original writings of great scientists who are suppressed, but whose writings are eminently reasonable and, and readable um, on, our, on our website. Um, we need to create a sensibility of people who can think about how, and again, this is the irony I didn't actually say, the West's salvation, the only practical pathway that we currently have to get out of this, this depopulation great reset, I swear to God, there's, you can't do that. You cannot do that unless you accept the olive branches that have been made, though you might not know about it, time and time again by Russia and China for the West to work with them on the Belt and Road projects as collaborators. It's, where, could it's, people, where could people find out more? on Belt and Road. And I guess who's some, who, what, what's some just decent sources or, or whatnot where people can get some. How about this? How about I, I what I'll do is um, send you a bunch of links of things that I like that you can maybe include in a recommended uh, website list in the video. This yeah, YouTube video. Sounds good. I'll do that. Yeah. Um, there's my website. I, I mean, I'll do some self promotion here. Like there's the oh, rise definitely. of creation.net. Yeah. Uh, or there's also a uh, Canadian patriot.org org. Um, which has a lot of material for people to explore, including videos and classes and other things that we do. Um, there's a few other things that I, I, I would recommend, at least on 
Yeah, I'll send you a list. And for people who might listen to this and would like to be a part of, let's say, the lectures, because every Sunday we host lectures featuring different experts from different fields uh, dealing with solutions and also history. Today, right now, we're doing a, a symposium of 12 lectures on statecraft and the lost art of statecraft. Um, this is every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And they can send an email to info at risingtidefoundation.net. Um, info at risingtidefoundation.net. And then they could get a Zoom link, ask questions, just take part in this type of process that we've been doing now for about 12 months. Um, yeah, and just, I, I, would, I would stop there because when, you, when they look at the websites, they can start exploring. But mm -hmm. they definitely need that, that idea of the whole in their mind. They yeah, need to have yeah. solutions that are concrete in their minds in order to not become Jacobin anarchists that can be weaponized to destroy nations without them even realizing how they're being used. Mm. That's something that, that peppers history is good people being induced to fall into a mob for just reasons, maybe sometimes, because, you know, they, they, they hate being exploited. But then that mob becomes easily weaponizable to disrupt a whole nation for the sake of, of social engineers. We don't yeah. want that to happen. Uh, we probably don't no. Um, so yeah, I'll definitely put all that information in. And you're running through a list just quickly because you you're running through a list there. So you said about sort of awakening, um, sort of you know cultivating. I just wanted to check you you finish your list because you're talking about in terms of what we should do, right? That we should cultivate um, a sort okay. of a high, you know higher you know better intellect, um, yeah. higher awakening. We should uh, reach out. We should um, look at what the, the these olive branches that are being extended to us. Um, with regard to the Belt and Road Initiative. So that was number two. Was just wanted to make sure you... Okay. Uh, other, other practicable, necessary things that need to happen is the financial system is going to blow, okay? That's a, provably, yeah. that's a scientifically provable, verifiable thing. The bubbles are going to pop. It's, it's already popping. Um, so the way you can have this done in such a way that involves uh, giving, putting the pain on the private financiers and not the people is through restoring bank separation like Glass-Steagall. That's a policy that is being fought for and has been fought for um, over the past, really since 2008. Restoring Glass-Steagall was the law that, that forced for many years a divide between commercial banking and investment speculative banking. Yeah. If you're a speculator and you, you, you gamble, you take a loss, no government bails you out because it's, you're a speculator. That's the mm -hmm. point is you take risks. Um, if you're a commercial bank, you're a, that means you're a boring, useful, productive bank. You take deposits, you give take savings, give loans to businesses, commercial enterprises. You're not going to see 1,000% profits. <laughs> you're yeah. a useful bank. If something goes wrong, then you, you have a government guarantee and you will be protected, but only because you're useful. So that's what was done in 1933 originally to reorganize the banking system. A lot of banks were uh, permitted to fail. Today... With it gone, including in Britain, it, it, this separation was destroyed under Thatcher's Big Bang in 1986. In Canada, it was destroyed the same year. Um, that allowed for the creation of universal, universal banking, these too big mm. to fails. They want to blow up the system and take us down with them, such that only the elite will, cl will clean up. Yeah. You know? I, suppose the, I suppose the trick with that is getting control of the political apparatus, does, you know, in order to, to kind of get the, that policy in place, is it not? Yeah, you need you need this to have a bit of, yeah, that's quite like like there are people who called for it, but they didn't put out a proper fight. Like Jeremy Corbyn at different times called for its restoration over the years. He didn't have a proper fight and backing behind him to properly competently carry out that sort of fight. It's yeah. a fight because it, you got to be prepared for this. So there is already momentum in various countries to get that, but that yeah. needs to be better. Because educated. you need to break through the divide and conquer. I mean, one of the reasons why you couldn't get a Corbyn, he couldn't get enough support behind him, is because you have. People on the you know people on the right th think he's a sort of um, he, he's going to you know take us to a hundred percent planned economy and whatnot and he's also very caught up in the identity politics and whatnot. So this is the trouble, I suppose, is that you do have certain figures and so I, I guess and this goes back to the first two points of, of your thinking is if you just can help and you know if you can help break this divide and conquer and, and help give people things to to unite on, then you can create. Yeah. the right structure upon which you can, you can start pushing and perhaps getting some success politically. Yeah, exactly. And, and the fact is right now we are being pushed into a major war with Russia and China. Russia and China are both facing U S military encirclements with ballistic missiles that can be made offensive very quickly on Russia's perimeter and China's perimeter, massive U S military forward basing on in the Philippines, 
uh, in South Korea, in uh, Japan, and many other places as part of an attack strategy to destroy China and Russia and remove from them their capability of launching a, a counter response. It's all under this full spectrum dominance. Yeah. So we're being pushed in that direction already. People need to have a more serious anti-war movement that doesn't just deal with anti-war, but also with what are you going to replace it with as far as a new system that we were, we're going to get one anyway. The question yeah. is, is it going to be behaving according to, uh, you know, dark age conditions or mutual development of things we all need anyway. Um, so we need those things. We need bank reform. We need a debt jubilee. Obviously like that's something you, the debt won't be paid. So yeah. why pretend that you're going to pay this debt, sustain this world bubble when it, you know, it won't be paid, hmm. declare it invalid make the losers take their losses, but protect people's savings, right? Like, like no people will be harmed if, you know, unless you, you gambled with money that wasn't yours. But so you need to just do the basic things. So people need to understand that, how this worked in the past. They need to study what Roosevelt did. Mm. They need to also study their, like read another culture, read Confucius, read the writings of Xi Jinping. You know, they're available online for 20 bucks, read them. Yeah. Get to see how the person is configur configuring their thoughts uh, read Plato, like have a study group and just work through the writings of great thinkers like Plato and talk about it, make yeah. it your own and see how that affects your judgment on everything else. Hmm. Do it for the course of a few months even, you know? Yeah. You'll find these things are all have, they have uh, value you can't put a dollar onto, but it's, it's what the oligarchy has been trying to keep from us with their artificial uh, school system that they put us through. That that was our right to to know these things, and we were not given that right. So now we have to use our time to to educate ourselves, and that's the way to do it. Go to yeah. source writings, share with other people, and try to learn how to communicate your thoughts better and better. And when you feel qualified to teach something, then take on more responsibility. Don't try to take an action without first having knowledge, because if you do that, you're going to make it a mess of things. Yeah. <laughs> oh. um, yeah. Yeah. No. Very good point. And on um, on just quickly. <laughs> On Bitcoin yeah. and on, on crypto, I know blockchain is very much part of the um, you know plans for centralized control and digital IDs and stuff like that. Do you have any insight on on Bitcoin on whether it's something that's being astroturfed on whether it's something that could be being trusted that we can trust? Um, what I'm just curious to get it, just to know if you've got any take on that. Mm, I would say I don't have anything particularly useful to say on that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm glad. I was expecting you. I, to I've dispel. got opinion, but I, 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 I'm not useful. Fair enough. I mean, I, I was expecting you to, to, you know, to 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 perhaps take the wind out of that sail. But I don't know. I mean, the more I look into that, the more you realize, at minimum, these guys aren't stupid, and there's a strong philosophical underpinning for what they're doing, and they're very grounded in these issues of central banking in many of the activities, much of the war funding and stuff. So, well, here's uh, what I would say. Here's what I say. As yeah. long as your society is committed to increasing the um, the productivity of things that are in the need of human beings to sustain life and improve that life to the degree that you're committed to those actions, then whatever type of currency yeah. you will allow into the system, whether it's digital currency or other, will be will serve a good purpose. Whereas you could have the freest, most non-centralized free currency uh, of, of the world, the most idealized blockchain Bitcoin system in place. Mm. But if you are committed to actions that are going to have negative ability yeah. to sustain your people it's gonna well, be a disaster. I, yeah and at the moment it's all speculative it's all speculation all the yeah, value yeah, yeah. that's got to be yeah. totally changed you know exactly all the all the value i mean there's not actually that much useful stuff that's really needed happening in, in the crypto space and and, I just, and sorry yeah, okay yeah, yeah finish your thought, finish your thought and then no, I, no, I was just i was just gonna say that it, there is a lot most of the economic activity is not not driving value it's all a lot of it's speculation and a lot of it's just noise and and whatnot yeah. and so um, yeah, from your from your point of view, you know, from what you were saying, it's definitely not quite there. And uh, yeah. Look, one thing I, I noticed is that you know, like while uh, while Musk and Elon Musk and others are are promoting, you know, they they've been a driving force in what they say changes the markets on valuations of Bitcoin or Dogecoin or whatever. Um, Musk is a part of, of the giving pledge, right? He's part of a coterie of billionaires like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. They're all part of the same thing. Um, Bezos is on that same list too. They're all in the top five. Um, it's 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 all psyops. Like the, while he, while he's inducing people in the millions to to do one thing and and look at only and fixate and it gets 
fetishistic and kind of weird sometimes to hear people talking about uh, Bitcoin the way that they do. It, it yeah. becomes almost a religion. Well, that's the thing that it While becomes the Bill god. Gates, mm. Yeah, and Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are going out and they're buying all the farmland, all the rail, yeah. all the the things that have real value uh, with or without an economic collapse. That that'll always have constant value. Yeah. Uh, so I think that people are, are being, they're not looking at what the oligarchs are actually doing. Not to say that Bill Gates or Warren Buffett are them, themselves their own men. They're not. But they represent, they're being used as mercenaries to do a job for a higher power. Yeah. But yeah, not. Al Schwab says you're going to own nothing, you're going to be happy. It's because these guys own everything that you're yeah. going to rent. And, 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 you know, Bitcoin can, you know, let's, let's assume that it is trustworthy. It is, it is dece- you know, it is decentralized and whatnot. It can still you know, they're thinking, okay, well, this thing exists now. Well, how can we, how can we still achieve our ends? How can we use it to our advantage? And one thing is to create a bunch of noise around it in the DeFi and all this other space, yeah. to get all this speculation happening and have people think like, this is the answer. And if we just, if I just kind of speculate with Bitcoin, then, you know, then we'll kind of, we'll break the central bankers without, I guess, taking enough of a building mindset. And um, yeah, it's highly romantic. Yeah. Uh, people got to get off their romantic yeah it it, it it there's some delusion it, it inside of this and yeah, yeah they be more constructive that's helpful that's yeah. very helpful um and i think yeah i think we can leave it there cool that, i really i really appreciate all your all your energy and, and kind of how you know how you're very much at pains to go to to kind of lay this stuff out properly for people um so it's been excellent thank you so much matthew well, thanks for having me on. Thanks for making the platform. And honestly, yeah, if you ever want to unpack another idea anytime in the future, let me know. And uh, this is enjoyable. I, I think this is a good conversation. Sounds great. I'll put all the um, I'll put all those links that we discussed in the description. Okay. All right. Um, I'll send you an email uh, yeah, uh, I... by tonight. I'll send you an email with links. Oh, by the way, yeah, people, uh, they'll see this as one of the links, but I think that people should uh, also, it would it'd be of high value to study some of the original longer writings of a recently deceased American economist named Lyndon LaRouche. Um, he died at the age of 96 or something a year and a half ago, but his writings, he's written thousands of documents, but just Google, I'll maybe send you a few uh, samples you could throw out there, but it's conceptually some of the richest philosophical useful material that I've come across that I've been able to put to use to make discoveries mm-hmm. that bear fruit. Um, really undermined, uh, like his works are very undermined and underrated, but I would say invest the, the effort to read those things. Um, but I'll send you some links, like I said. Perfect. Uh, I'll put those in and yeah, guys, I recommend that you, you know, read, read that stuff, but also, you know, I recommend that you dig into to Matt's work because it's just an array. It really covers some really important bases. And, and like I said, from, from, you know, from my own perspective, it's helped give my thinking about this stuff sort of my thoughts some kind of my theories and some things that i some patterns that i saw kind of giving them some strong foundation so definitely go and check matthew's work out and cheers matt cheers man keep going <laughs> keep doing what you're doing yeah you too hey right, talk to you later all right bye thank you for listening to that if you enjoyed the way that i think about these issues then you might enjoy pith weekly so pith weekly is my blog which i email out every saturday morning uh, somewhere where I share my latest thinking on metapolitics and I also share some highlights of what I've read. I'm always digging through some really critical texts uh, in the area um, and it's it's something which is um, the center point for what I'm doing. Uh, you know, the reality is we don't really know what's going to happen and what platforms people are going to be kicked off o- of over the next few months, whether YouTube, Twitter, whether Gab's going to take off. But that will always be there. My email will always be there. I will always be sending my my best thoughts out and my best learnings out every Saturday morning. So I really hope some of you subscribe. You can find the link in the description. Um, and it'd be great to, to have you as part of my community, as a node in my network. Um, so thanks again.